Chapter 11, Is It Wrong to Show Off These Gains? By the time Hestia arrived back home, it was already night. The sun had fallen beneath the horizon, and the moon had already taken its place in the sky. When Hestia arrived at corner leading to the front of the church, a tinge of guilt filled her chest. Would Belle be worried about her like she was him when he went into the dungeon? She said that she would be back earlier, but instead she took so long. Hestia bit her lips and then walked to the iron gates. Only to be greeted by the sight of a man with a bare and muscular torso doing handstand push-ups. Eat. Hestia was flustered at the sight and she dropped the latch of the iron gate, sending out a loud clang. That caused the man to pause and then do a flip, landing on his feet. After that, he turned towards the gate, letting Hestia see his features. A chiseled and heroic face, with just the faint trace of femininity. Beautiful crimson eyes sparkling like rubies. A completely chiseled torso with muscles that could have been carved from stone. An ethereal white hair that looked like wisps of moonlight. Oh, there you are, Tia. I was wondering what was keeping you. Was business good today? A suave and confident voice, as smooth as butter. For a brief moment, Hestia wondered if it was a god standing there. Another trying to court her. Considering Apollo's attempts back in heaven, this wasn't too out there. But this was the first time that Hestia felt like this. Her body was warm and her face felt hot. At the same time, her heart pounded in her chest, as if it was trying to fly out. The man blinked and waved his hand. Hello? Tia? You alright? H. He even called her Tia. Such a cute name and such a sexy voice. Wait. Tia? Hestia blinked again and then carefully stared at the man, putting her weird reaction aside for the moment. White hair. Crimson eyes. And that nonchalant manner of speaking as well as the nickname. Hestia cautiously called out. Belle. Well, die. Who else would it w wait? Tia. Hi. That was weird. She could have sworn she was staring at him. Why was the sky suddenly dash? Triple X. I sighed and tucked Hestia into bed. Silly goddess. It seemed like she pushed herself too much today. No, probably in these past few days. I had a feeling Hestia wasn't used to staying up, and she'd been staying up with me for two whole nights already while waking up early in the morning. Well. At least it looks like she ate properly. I glanced at her bag and saw that the sandwich wrappers were in there. Maybe her body just wasn't used to proper nutrition and she passed out? Mm. I'll need to make her a proper breakfast then. If that was the case, she definitely needed more food. But for her now. I considered going to sleep, but my body was practically boiling with energy. If I had to take a guess, I would say it was a side effect of taking too many potions, or maybe because I had improved my physique to the point where I didn't need much sleep. Probably the first option. But that caused a problem. I'm not sleepy. And that meant that I had a lot of time to kill. I stared out at the sky. Since the moon was still high, there was a long time until morning. M.M. I stared at Hestia's sleeping form and then walked back out into the courtyard. Might as well keep training. I pulled my knife out from my inventory and then mentally reviewed the weak points of the goblins and kobolds. Image training should be just as effective. So. I stepped out into the moonlight and focused. Space seemed to flicker before shadowy figures emerged. Goblins and kobolds. Not the real thing, of course. I wasn't capable of that. Maybe later if I did some more testing or snuck some out, but definitely not now. No, these were similar to the pen and notebooks I could make. A sort of self-imposed delusion. Imaginary. But to me, they were real enough to fight. I recreated the scenario I found myself in the first time in the dungeon and nodded. Let's go. Triple X. Hestia opened her eyes to the smell of eggs frying on a pan. Hi. For a moment, she was confused. The last thing she remembered was. That man. Hestia jumped out of the mattress and then ran to the kitchen. And when she did. Well. I guess you're hungry after all, aren't you, Tia? Makes sense considering you skipped dinner. It was the man from yesterday. Giving a roguish smile that felt like it could steal her heart. He casually flipped an omelette around in a skillet. He was also familiar. And now in daylight, she was sure of it. Belle. That's you, right? 
the man. No, Bell rolled his eyes and said, What, am I so different that my dear goddess can't recognize me anymore? Yes. Hestia quickly nodded. You are. She walked over and stared at him, looking up and down. Unlike yesterday, he was fully clothed. His old shirt had been tossed on over his top, but it was too small now, clinging to his body and revealing his midriff. His pants were too short as well, more than a few inches too high from his ankles. As for his shoes, the poor things were ripped now, turned into nothing more than makeshift sandals. Ah! Bell coughed and said, I suppose I did have a bit of a growth spurt. A bit. Bell was already taller than her, but now he practically loomed over her. In fact, she was fairly certain he was just as tall as my ache now, if not taller, and that natural gigolo was already towering. Bell shrugged. Well, I am in my growing phase. I mean, I'm only fifteen, you know. Fifteen. Hestia blinked and then let out a deep sigh. No. I suppose that makes sense. Children do grow a lot in their teenaged years. But. She turned to look at Bell and said, how in the world did this happen? Was it his skill? That liar's phrase did say that growth was determined by his beliefs. So was it that? No. Even if there was a ridiculous ability that allowed someone to grow so fast, it wouldn't result in this. Would it? Ah. Bell nodded and set the omelette aside on a plate before starting to cook another. That would probably be because I experimented training with potions. Training with potions? Yep. Bell cracked a few eggs into the skillet and said, the body grows after healing from damage it takes in training, so I thought why not try out using potions to see if that makes it grow faster from healing faster. Hestia frowned. That doesn't work though. The potion would just heal all the wounds. My ache told me that. It came up in a casual conversation one time while she was wondering if she could make a way to get super strong adventurers to advertise her familia more. Well, normally it does. But if you dilute it enough, the potion's healing effects actually just jumpstarts the body's normal healing effects. He paused. Though it also doesn't work if you don't train until your body feels like it's on fire. You really need to reach a certain point of damage first so that it doesn't just erase your work. Found that out the hard way. Hestia blinked. And then she sighed. Bell. Has anyone told you how strange you are? Honestly, who would even think of such a thing? No, considering what he said. It didn't seem to be easy even if it was simple. Although the potion would heal the body, if it was to that point, wouldn't he be in constant pain as it healed? More than a few times. But that's what you get for living with storybooks all your life. He shrugged and then grabbed the omelette. Now here. Eat up and get ready for work. I'll get started on your lunch in a bit. Yep. Same old Bell. Even though he'd become a smoking hot stud, he was still the nonchalant and caring young man that offered to join her familia. Tia. Nothing, Bell. Triple X. That was a bit embarrassing, but at least it's sorted out now. I stared at my reflection in the mirror and nodded. After Hestia left for work, I went shopping for new clothes. It was a given, considering I looked like I was wearing kids' clothes after my growth spurt. Now I had changed up my look a bit. When I came to Orario, I had a tan coat that Grandpa gave me. It already was a bit too small since it was a gift from a while back, but now the only thing it could serve as was a makeshift cloak. Still, it was fairly fashionable. Other than that though, my clothes weren't too sophisticated. A plain black shirt, a bit loose to be comfortable moving in. Matching pants and a new set of boots. Paired with the knife strapped at my side, I looked like someone fresh off the boat from Final Fantasy or something. A proper JRPG protagonist. Hi. I brushed my wispy silver hair. Before it was a bit of a mess, but now that I had grown a bit, it looked cool instead of dorky. I knew you had it in you, Belle. I smiled and stuck my thumb up at my reflection. Bit scary that it only took a day though. Potions were a heck of a drug. Literally. Though since I looked like this now, I had a problem. Again. I glanced over to the cotton tunic I got from the guild and frowned. I'll need new armor. And I'll need to get more groceries too. I glanced back at the almost empty pantry and frowned. I rolled my shoulder and said, well. Might as well go talk with Inna. It was about time I went back to the dungeon for some refueling. 
After locking up, I made my way out into Main Street and headed towards the Guild building like usual. But as I passed the commercial district, I felt a gaze on me. A familiar one. But it was different this time too. I could sense, confusion? Excitement? Before I could react to that and move away, someone called out to me. Sir. Wait, sir. A familiar female voice. I considered ignoring it, but my gut told me that it would be more trouble than it was worth. So instead, I turned around. The silver-haired girl in a waitress outfit. Her name was. Seer, if I remembered right. She smiled at me and said, I almost didn't recognize you. She laughed and said, did you eat some magic beans and grow overnight or something? I laughed back and said, or something. I was starting to worry that I'd be a scrawny kid forever, but it looks like I finally got my growth spurt. To emphasize that, I pulled my arm out to flex. A vain display, hoping that it would distract her or turn her off. But of course, she didn't care. Instead, I could practically see stars forming in her eyes at that. Wow. I let out an internal sigh and then lowered my arm. It's nothing much. Apparently fighting in the dungeon's a good workout. Who knew? Seer giggled. You're right. Ah, but then does that mean you're heading back into the dungeon today, sir? I nodded, deciding it was better to tell the truth. I am. The name's Belle, by the way. I held out my hand to her. Seer's eyes widened and she smiled, happily grabbing my hand. It's nice to meet you properly today, Mr. Bell. I'm Seer. And thank you so much for letting me keep the magic stone. It made Mama Mia let me off the hook for skipping dishes the other day. I'm glad to hear it. Now, if you'll excuse me. I turned tried to pull back my hand, preparing to make a quick escape. But as if she knew, Seer tightened her grip. Wait. Don't leave yet. That time I actually sighed. Still, I put on a faint smile and said, fine, fine. I'll wait. Wouldn't want a beautiful girl like you to ruin her reputation by chasing me across Orario. Seer giggled and said, well, you'd better not leave then, or I'll have you take responsibility. I smiled, taking care not to say anything. Be right back. Seer waved and then dashed off. As she did, I focused on my surroundings. Strange. I was certain that Seer was that goddess but I could still feel a gaze staring at me. Not only that, but today I didn't sense anything weird from Seer. It was like she was just an ordinary young woman. Did I mistake it last time? Maybe it was my paranoia. Seer seemed nice enough, after all. A bit clingy and definitely crushing on me harder than even Hestia, but that was P.A.R. for the course for teenaged girls. And since I still felt someone staring at me. Maybe it was a coincidence the first time? After a few minutes, Seer re-emerged, carrying a wrapped purple package. She was also out of breath, although she let out a smile when she saw me. You didn't run away this time. You make it sound like I ran away last time. Seer giggled. Anyway. Here. A gift for giving me the magic stone last time. An adventurer is nothing on an empty stomach, so have some breakfast on me. I blinked. E.R. Thanks. I grabbed the package and then looked back at Seer. But are you sure? Since she was only gone for a brief period of time, it was definitely pre-prepared. And from the cloth. Was she making it every day waiting for me? No, girls like to wrap their food in their favorite colors, so was this her breakfast? MMHM. But if it makes you feel better, you can come eat at my workplace to pay me back tonight. Ah. I frowned. That'll be a problem though. I'm in charge of dinner for my familia, so that won't work. Oh well. Seer looked upset, but then her eyes lit up. Well, why don't you come for lunch then? Or just whenever you're free? Saying that, she fidgeted with her hands. Seeing her trying so hard, I sighed and said, all right. I'll swing by to grab lunch later. Probably not today, since I really need to go do things, but I'll remember to go visit tomorrow. Great. Seer smiled and said, it's called the Hostess of Fertility, right over there. She pointed to a cafe on the opposite side of the street and said, see it? I do. In that case. She let go of my hand and smiled. I'll be waiting for your visit, Mr. Bell. After a small wave, 
Seer ran back across the street and into the building. And the moment she did, I felt that sharp gaze from somewhere up above, as if trying to peer into my very soul. All right. So maybe it wasn't Seer after all. A jealous god, perhaps? Whatever the case, I pretended not to notice it and kept walking. Hopefully it would be fine. If not. Well, hopefully I could grind my stats and get famous enough for it to be a non-issue. It'd be a shame to see Orario lit up like the 4th of July. Though I guess it'd be a pretty sight to show Tia. Which reminded me. I should take Tia out on a date sometime. She clearly liked me, and I liked spending time with her. Plus, we were already living together like a couple, so we might as well try it out. Wait. Could a goddess even date a mortal? There weren't any laws against that, but I didn't hear about any married goddess slash mortal couples either. Let's delay that a little bit. Gotta make a name for myself first. Now, off to the dungeon. After checking in with Inna. Didn't want to get an earful later when she found out I went in without letting her know. Chapter 12, Is It Wrong to Pick Up a Chick in the Dungeon? Morning, Inna. Are you busy today? Inna paused in the middle of reading a book and looked up at me, confused. Pardon. Oh yeah. I keep forgetting. It's Belle by the way. Belle. 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 Inna jumped to her feet, completely forgetting about her book. At the same time, people in the guild hall turned to look at us. Inna blushed and then grabbed her book. After tucking it under her arm, she grabbed my hand and marched me to her office. After seating me down and sitting down at her desk, Inna let out a sigh and said, I knew it. You're just a real handful, aren't you, Mr. Cranel? I coughed. It's not my fault. I had a growth spurt. A growth spurt that involves you growing six inches and putting on a over dozen pounds of muscle. It was a calculated growth spurt. Inna groaned and said, what did you even do? Is this your skill? Your magic? No, did you go back into the dungeon? You did, didn't you? Hey now, what do you think I am? Stupid. I shook my head and then pulled out a book from my bag. Or rather, pretended to pull a book from my bag while I really took it from my inventory. Here. This is my training log of what I did in these past few days. Inna took the book and flipped through. And then she paused and flipped through again. On the third time, her eyes went wide and she looked up at me. This. Are you telling the truth, Belle? Of course I am. Come on, Inna. I thought we were friends. My apologies. But you just continue to pull out surprises, don't you? She sighed and shook her head. To create a training regime using carefully measured potions and pushing yourself to the limits. Theoretically, it should work. Experimentally, it does. For you. Inna frowned. But you seem to be a bit of an outlier here, Belle. While I'm sure that this training works, I don't think it was the only reason why you grew so much. True. I probably have good genetics too. Genetics. Ah, uh, I mean it probably runs in the blood. Inna nodded. Possibly. It would explain why your status is so strange. She paused and looked at me. Are you sure you don't know why that might be the case? Maybe your parents were adventurers. M.M. I paused to think about it. It's possible. Grandpa never mentioned anything like that, but I never really asked either. And since he died. At that, a faint regret passed through me. Not my emotion, but one that was mine now regardless. I'm sorry. I smiled. It's fine. Just another thing to add to the list of regrets. Inna gave me a wry smile. Afterwards though, she looked at my book and said, Do you mind if I make a copy of this? I'll redact the private information, of course, but dash. Feel free. If it helps more people stay alive, then I'm all for it. Inna's smile turned genuine and she said, You're too nice, Belle. Only for you. Yeah. Inna blushed. I laughed. Inna was really too fun to tease. Inna huffed and said, You shameless flirt. Just because you look older now doesn't mean you should lose your morals, kid. I paused. Oh. Right. Half-elves lived a long time, didn't they? I bowed my head and said, Sorry, Miss Toole. I'll be more respectful of my elders. T that's going a bit too far. 
I'm only 17 you know. Eh. I blinked and looked up. Really? In a huff. Really? But you seem so mature. Ha. Huh. You're lucky you're so damned cute. I blinked. All right. Maybe teasing was backfiring. Note to self, rein that back. Nothing. Inna stood up and said, I'm going to copy this. Anything else you need in the meantime? I might as well grab it. Oh yeah. Could you get me a few books on fighting styles? Fighting styles. All right. I'll be back soon. Triple X. I stepped onto the first floor of the dungeon, mentally reviewing my new information. After Inna came back with the books, she grilled me on the exact details of my training for a while. I obviously elaborated in the excruciating detail expected of me, though it caused her to have a weird expression and make a lot of notes. After that though, we just went over fighting styles, combat techniques, tactics, etc. Inna had a lot of theoretical knowledge in that regard, but she confessed that she didn't have any first-hand knowledge. Of course, that knowledge translated directly to application for me, so that was a non-issue. I spun my knife around in my right hand and then looked around. As always, I could sense that malicious presence staring at me from the moment I arrived. This time though, I also felt something else. A few presences from up ahead that weren't malicious. However, they were fairly powerful. Maybe adventurers heading deeper down into the dungeon? I wasn't about to bother them though. While there were some unspoken rules in the dungeon, those were mostly formalities. And accidents were all too easy to fake. I was fairly confident in my ability to survive considering I made a few more trump cards just in case, but when I thought about how ridiculous some skills other adventurers have might be, I figured it wasn't worth the effort to antagonize anyone. Which was why I went out of my way to head towards a more deserted part of the first floor. It was still morning. Despite that, I didn't sense many other adventurers around. It seemed like the common practice was to rush it down to the deeper floors for better loot. Made sense. Technically, you could charge up to the seventh floor with stats below H. I wasn't about to risk that though. The first floor was fairly low in encounter rates, so it should be good to practice on. Other than me being jumped the other day. But I was prepared this time and even looking forward to that. This time around, I wasn't going to get beat up so easily. But it seemed like the dungeon had been expecting that since no monsters popped up. Even when looking around, I didn't see any of those shadowy presences that indicated a monster. Hi. I stopped at a room with with an intersection. It was odd. I'd been walking around for more than a few minutes now and there weren't any monsters at all. For something like that to happen. Keeb. A sudden bird cry echoed, followed by a golden blur rushing towards me. Eh. There shouldn't be any birds in the dungeon, so what the heck dash. A chorus of roars. Cobalts. Immediately following them, there was the manic laughing of goblins. I blinked and then saw that there was a horde of monsters rushing after the golden blur rushing towards me. I frowned and drew my knife. I don't know what's going on, but I guess this is a good test. The golden blur came to a stop in front of me. When it did, it looked up, letting me get a good glimpse at it. A tiny golden bird with beautiful emerald feathers, only about the size of my palm. Its eyes were a sparkling rainbow color and it was trembling in fear. It glanced back at the monster horde and then started trembling even more, ducking behind my leg. Cheeb. I could sense it now. The bird wasn't actually a bird. At least, I had never heard of a bird that had magical powers here in Orario. Was it a monster then? But then why was a monster being chased by other monsters? And why did it try to get me to help? Meh, whatever. Hey, birdie. Cheeb. The bird looked up at me. It seemed like it understood. That helped out. Not sure what's going on. But you should step back. I might accidentally hit you in the fight. Cheeb. The bird nodded and then stepped back. But it kept looking at me, hesitant. Was it because it thought I was weak? I laughed and said, don't worry. I can handle this. After that, we'll sort out just what the heck you are and get you back to your owner. With that, I shifted my focus to the approaching horde. One, two, it was a crowd of twelve goblins and four kobolds. A bit more than the other day. Even though I had been training a lot, it would still be dangerous to fight them in an open area. 
especially if I wanted to keep that cute bird safe. Fortunately, I didn't have to fight them in an open area. Since the bird had been running away from the horde, those monsters were charging in a cramped passageway. Wide enough only for about three at a time. I made some mental calculations and then decided. In a pinch, I'd pull my trump cards out. But this should be doable. So. I kicked off the ground and ran towards the first goblin. It shifted its focus to me and screamed, lunging at my head. With that first act, I noticed the other monsters shifting their attention to me as well, probably because I was a bigger threat. Smart, but also not smart at the same time. You see, these monsters were more vicious than intelligent, and the moment that they focused on me, the organized charge became a chaotic mush pit. Except for that goblin that had lunged away first. Scree! It slashed out its clawed hands, trying to grab my head. But. Again, jumping isn't very smart. It committed to an attack it couldn't change. The moment it entered my range, I dipped my body to the side, dodging its attack. At the same time, I grabbed its leg with my left hand and then stomped, using the force to send the goblin back at the horde. It screamed and knocked over a kobold before getting lost in the mess near the back. But I wasn't out of danger. Despite the chaotic mess, the monsters were getting back on their feet faster than anticipated. Was it because the dungeon really wanted me gone? Or was the bird special? I didn't know, but just as the goblin got mixed back in, a pair of kobolds charged at me. Like before, they had stone clubs. Unlike before, they showed a bit of coordination. One lunged at me, jumping into the air with a heavy overhead smash. The other charged, swinging the club in a heavy sideways smash to bowl me over. Or rather, to break my ribs. I could end everything by blasting them with my trump cards, but this trip was for training. So. I charged as well. Carefully judging the attack trajectories, I interrupted the cobalt on the ground with a tackle, sending him staggering back. Because of that, the timing was off and the cobalt in the air crashed into the other cobalt, sending both into a sprawling mess. I quickly stepped forward and cut into both of their chests. And as I did. Squelch. A disgusting fleshy noise, like a suction cup. From the gap I made in their chests, the magic stones instantly flew into my inventory, causing the monsters to dissolve away. Unlike before, they didn't leave behind any tails though. That was interesting though. I had assumed my inventory was just a passive place. But it seemed like it could be used as a pseudo appendage in a way as well. If I didn't put something completely into my inventory, then could I? Cheap cheap. The bird's twitter echoed, frantic. I blinked and then realized that knives were being thrown at me. Wait, knives? I looked up to see a group of three leering goblins, smirks on their face. It seemed like they were confident. And if I was any other adventurer, that would have been justified. Unfortunately for them, projectiles didn't work on me. I instantly grabbed the projectiles with my inventory, storing them away. When the goblins saw the knives vanish, they froze. That time, I smirked and then opened my inventory, sending the knives back. But not at first. Instead, I looped them at a slight downward angle, building up velocity with gravity as acceleration. And when it reached terminal velocity, I released them. Silver blurs cut through the dark dungeon walls and pierced into the goblins. Immediately, they slumped over. But it seemed that everyone was on a projectile streak today. The two remaining kobolds picked up some goblins and spun, throwing them at me. The goblins screamed, but quickly oriented themselves in the air to attack. In that case, I got my trump cards ready out of caution, but I wanted to try something. When the goblins got in arm's reach, I pulled them into my inventory. There was immediate resistance. Like trying to stuff a box that was already full, no, more like trying to put two magnets together of opposite polarities. The goblins went halfway into my inventory, freezing for a bit in the air, but no more. Then again, I was expecting that. Before they could do anything else, I quickly ejected them, sending them back the way they came. Since I couldn't perfectly store them, some of their momentum was lost, but they still flew back pretty fast. The goblins rolled on the ground, screaming. Seeing that, the kobolds stared at me, cautious. Cheeb. The bird tweeted behind me. I ignored it and slowly walked forward. Yet. Yeah. It should be fine like this. I was certain now. Killing them would be easy. 
My new skill was versatile enough for me to do so in countless ways. But that wasn't the point of me coming down here. I rolled my shoulder and then held out my left hand, taunting them. Come on. Let's get this show on the road, guys. They didn't understand me. But they understood the provocation. The goblins screamed and charged. In unison, the remaining kobolds roared and charged as well. Seeing that advance, I smirked, tightening my grip on my knife. A grey limb, aimed at my head. I dodged it and swung my knife at the joint, cleanly severing it from the body. At the same time, I kicked out behind me, stopping the kobold trying a back attack. Dodge, block, intercept, counter, stab, slash, punch. It was weird. Like a musician playing scales, I had been going over the information in my head and trained my body to prepare for the big rehearsal. And now, it was flowing together. Energy manipulation showed me the faint ripples just before the monsters would attack and mapped out attack trajectories both before my eyes, and as an overall intuitive sixth sense. It was a deluge of information that would have made any other person stagger. But compilation neatly took that information and assimilated it into direct application, letting me react without hesitation by turning it into instinct. Was this the effect of liar's phrase? I knew it was possible. I believed it to be possible. And because of that belief, I was doing it. A baseless confidence that was being supported by a unique skill that gave it a foundation. No, a foundation that required such baseless confidence. In short. Fake it till you make it. I pivoted on my right heel, dodging a kobold's heavy overhead swing. While it was overextended, I quickly stepped back, tackling it. The kobold staggered, loosening its grip on the club. I kicked the club, sending it loose and then grabbed it with my inventory before swapping it to my left hand. Letting my knife go, I switched grips and then swung the club like a baseball bat at the monsters. A clean thwack. A few goblins immediately flew through the air, blood and teeth scattering. The remaining kobold charged at me with his own swing. Did it think I was overextended? Unfortunately, I didn't need such heavy swings to use my pilfered weapon. While it swung, I propped up the stone club to intercept, angling it to deflect the blow. The kobold's swing struck my club, causing a strong feedback and making my hands a bit numb. It also caused my club to shatter, breaking into pieces. As a result, the kobold overextended, caught off guard. I immediately stepped forward and pierced its chest with my knife before sweeping its legs. The kobold slumped to the ground. But it wasn't dead yet. To make sure of it, I rammed the shattered hilt of my club into its nose and then stomped on its neck. A loud crack. After that, I looked up at the remaining monsters. There were, three goblins left. They were also giving me a leery look, twitching in fear. It was almost pitiful. Almost. Except that I remembered what they liked to do to adventurers, especially female adventurers before they killed them. So before they had a chance to run away, I played my ace in the hole. Three white lines shot through the air, perfectly aimed at the goblins' chests. A soft crack echoed as their magic stones shattered, and then they turned into dust. And I was alone. Well, alone with a bunch of monster corpses. Speaking of which. I knelt down to the kobold and tried to put it into my inventory, and I failed. Like before, there was a weird repulsive effect. No. This time it wasn't that I couldn't push it in, but rather something was pulling it back. The dungeon. And as I attempted that, I felt something glare at me. A tremendous malicious intent. I immediately stopped trying. When I did, that glare faded. Still there, but less I will kill you the moment you try that again and more one slip up and it's over. But it did confirm that I probably could store corpses in there, just, you know, not when there's an abstract malevolent will already claiming said corpses. At least, I could take the drops and magic stones though. I walked over to each corpse and made a quick incision, just enough to where I could reach in to grab the magic stone. After that, I swept everything into my inventory. The result? Ten goblin magic stones, four cobalt magic stones, and no drop items. Not this time, it seemed. Though I did pick up some of those goblin daggers and the cobalt clubs, so maybe those counted? I didn't intend on selling them though. Much more useful to keep as trump cards. After all, who would expect a random knife to fly at them or a giant stone club out of nowhere in the middle of a fight? I examined my inventory one more time, 
analyzed the surroundings to make sure that I was safe, and since the only source of energy I could sense nearby was that bird, it seemed like I was. Speaking of that bird. I turned back to look at it. You still here, bud? Cheep. The bird hopped around a few times, cheeping happily, and then dashed towards my leg. After that, it nuzzled its head against me, as if thanking me. I laughed and knelt down to pat its head. No problem, little guy. Though, what are you? I could sense mana from it. Not just that, but I could see that it had a magic stone too. But it was different from the monsters. First of all, it wasn't hostile. Second of all, the color was a bit different. If I had to describe the monster's mana, it was a malevolent reddish purple, almost like blood. But the little bird's mana was a royal violet, like pure amethyst. Not only that, but I could see faint wisps of emerald and gold too. Cheep. The bird tilted its head to look at me. I chuckled and scratched its head. Well, I guess it doesn't really matter. You really shouldn't be in a place like this though, little guy. Despite the mana it had, the bird was weak. Like, super weak. So weak that I was pretty sure if I poked it wrong, it would fall over and die. But it was sure good at running away, considering how fast it had been. Cheep. The bird nodded as if it agreed with me. Then, it quickly jumped, flying through the air onto my shoulder. Cheep cheep. I blinked and then laughed. What? You want to come with me? Cheep. The bird nodded its head. I smiled and scratched its head again with my finger, but then I frowned. That'll be a problem though. I'm not sure how the guild treats monsters. The little guy was harmless, but I had a feeling the guild wouldn't think so. That, and I also had a feeling that such a rare monster would immediately get hunted down by other adventurers to see what it dropped. No, to get a hand on its magic stone. And considering how odd it looked to me, I was sure it was probably worth a lot too. Cheep cheep. The bird lowered its head dejectedly. Hmm. I feel bad about leaving you down here though. It was fast, but not fast enough to where I couldn't have caught it. And since I wasn't much better than the average adventurer yet, let alone the higher level ones, I was sure that it would be caught if I left it alone. That, or it'd get hunted down by other monsters. Cheep. The bird looked up at me, excited. Cheep cheep. Man, I wish I had a translation skill right now. It'd be nice to hear what my new friend was saying. But. Hmm. Um, I looked at the bird and said, hey. This might be dangerous, but do you want to try something? Cheep. You see, I've got this ability dash. Crack. A sudden surge of shadows. Before I could finish my sentence, the walls, ceilings, and floors opened up with cracks. Ch cheep. The little bird started to tremble. Guess this place doesn't want you to leave with me. I narrowed my eyes. This time, all I could see were cobalts. But that was fine by me. Well. Stick tight, little guy. I pulled out my knife again and got ready. We'll sort you out as soon as I deal with these annoying guys. Ah, but for now. I tried putting the bird into my inventory. As expected, it didn't stick, immediately pulled out by the dungeon, or whatever that malevolent will was. But did the bird realize my intent? The little guy resisted that pull and forcibly shoved itself into my inventory. Cheep cheep. The moment it did, the bird's cheeps changed. Instead of being off to the side, it sounded kind of like it came from headphones. Somewhere in the middle of my head. But I didn't have the time to think about how or why that was. For now. Let's go. I had to fight. Chapter 13, Is It Wrong To Give My Advisor A Big Headache? I stepped back onto Babel, my bag stuffed to the brim with magic stones. And my body once again sore. Damn it. I grumbled and massaged my right arm. Stupid dogs. All they know how to do is attack with brute force. That usually wasn't a problem but when I had to deal with a constant onslaught for over an hour as kobolds kept spawning. Even with my gains, I would get sore. I need to build more stamina. I winced as I massaged a sore spot and sighed before lowering my arm. Cheep. A concerned chirp. In the corner of my vision, I saw the little golden bird look at me. It wasn't actually there. Because I wasn't sure how people would react to it. I politely asked for it to stick around in the inventory until I called it out after explaining the situation. 
The little guy seemed to understand though, and now it was just in that weird holographic state my books were usually in. I glanced at it and said, it's fine. Not your fault. Well, it was probably your fault, but I'm the stubborn guy who wanted to fight them properly. It would have been a simple matter to just kill them off with portal-esque shenanigans, but that would build a bad habit. Instead, I fought them off in melee combat to train. Knife skills. Dual knife skills. Taekwondo. Karate. Since I had to face a continuous flow of cobalts, I took the time to practice the fighting skills from the books I read. It went pretty well in my opinion. I wasn't an expert by any means, but I had a good handle for combat flow now at least. And it was definitely confirmed that compilation directly translated theory to practice somehow. Mechanics of how that happened were still up in the air, but it worked. And it made me really want to pick up a magic theory book at some point. I had my thoughts, but I wanted a proper basis to work off first, which meant I needed to work harder and save up more money to buy one. I sighed and then made my way to the exchange hall, only to be greeted by a line about a hundred people deep. Seeing that, I changed my mind and started walking towards the guild building where I usually met Inna. A few people glanced at me as I walked past. Probably because of my white hair standing out so much. But since I carried myself well, I didn't get any trouble. I did sense more than a few people stare at my stuffed bag, but they took another look at me, especially my muscles, and decided against it. Yay for judging a book by its cover. I knew getting buff was a good idea. Cheeb. Oh yeah. I'm going to go talk to a friend about you, alright? After that, you can decide if you want to stick with me or head out on your own. Cheeb. The bird nodded and smiled, well, as much as a bird without a proper mouth could smile. In the meantime, I pulled out the food Seer gave me from my inventory. Well, I made sure to make a show of reaching into my bag first. After that, I unwrapped it. Sandwiches. Cheese sandwiches. Pretty basic, but not bad. I pulled one out and munched on one as I left the Tower of Babel. Sheep. The moment I did, the bird let out a long chirp. Like a sigh. I glanced at it and saw the little guy staring at the blue sky. What, never seen the sky before? The bird shook its head. Cheep. Cheep cheep. Cheep. I still can't understand you, but I'll take it that you haven't. I chuckled and then kept walking. As I did, I saw the little guy spin its head around like a bobblehead to look at everything. Seemed like the little guy never actually did see the outside world before. Then was it really a monster? That reaction wasn't one that a normal bird would have if it was out here. Then again, it was also too smart to be a normal bird. Eh. I'd sort it out within a... Munching on my sandwich. I glanced around at people as I walked. It looked to be around noon, meaning that I hadn't been in the dungeon that long. Though, considering the amount of trouble I got during that time period, maybe that was a good thing. Anyway, there weren't many adventurers around. I saw a few here and there walking about, probably on a break, but for the most part the people around were normal citizens without a shred of power. Still weird to think I could gauge people by an intangible thing as energy now, but say Lavi. Life was weird like that. Anyway, normal people. Making my way down the streets, I noticed a lot of them staring at me. Was my appearance really that odd? Or was something wrong? I frowned and gave myself a quick once over. Nope. I was fine. Clothes were in perfect order. Albeit a bit wrinkled and sweaty, and the only odd thing about me was my bag and my knife. But considering that I could see a few other adventurers with even more dangerous weapons and larger bags bursting with coins, it wasn't that. Eh. Not that big a deal. Ignoring the looks I got, I walked over to meet with Inna in her office. Triple X. You what? I winced at the loud voice and waved my hand. E.R. It wasn't that bad, Inna. Promise. Not that you have a hundred cobalt magic stones. Oh. Was it that many? I put my hand on my chin, musing about that. I guess I was fighting for a while. In a sight and sat down at her desk. I'm starting to regret our relationship. I didn't know we were dating. You know what I mean. I chuckled. We were back in Anna's office with the door firmly shut. It seemed like she had a feeling she was going to get riled up, so she made sure to take precautions ahead of time. 
Inna put her arms on the table and massaged her temple. What in the world is going on? I didn't even know so many kobolds could be spawned on the first floor. Yet. Me neither. Inna glared at me and said, and you? Why in the world did you stick around to fight them all? Didn't you read the warnings in the books I gave you? MMHM. An adventurer shouldn't go on an adventure. Unless they want to die. So why did you? Because it wasn't an adventure. I frowned and said, I mean, kobolds aren't that dangerous. They are in hordes of that many. In a face palmet and said, what am I going to do with you? Are you going to try and take out an entire colony of killer ants too when you reach the fourth floor? Please. I'm not that stupid. So you admit you're stupid. I coughed and said, anyway, it was fine. I was only on the first floor, and I could have run away if I wanted to. Although it was a lot, it wasn't like they charged after me in a horde. They learned not to after I shot them down with some metal shrapnel, but I decided to keep quiet about that. In a side. I suppose that's true. And you aren't the reckless sort like some other adventurers I know. Right. I nodded. I know my limits. Today was just a training trip. Ended up escalating a bit too much for my comfort, but overall, good haul. Right. Inna stared at the pile of magic stones and then looked at my bag. Speaking of your earnings. Just how did you fit so many magic stones in your bag? Very carefully, is what I'd like to say. But before then, I've got a question for you, Inna. What is it? Are bags of holding a thing? Or item boxes? You know, things bigger on the inside than on the outside. Inna frowned. I don't believe so. If something like that existed, it would be priceless. And if it does, it's probably held by one of the strongest familia as a secret. Why? Ah. I coughed. Inna froze and then she groaned. Don't tell me you found one in the dungeon. E.R. No. But my magic lets me do basically that. Silence. And then Inna sighed. Please be careful, Belle. I don't intend to ask you just how many outrageous things you can do for your own safety, but remember that the gods came down to this world for entertainment. If word gets out about your status or even about that magic of yours, it would get messy. I know. I nodded and said, that's why I'm being careful. Besides, I trust you to not spill the beans. Your trust is too heavy, Belle. In a side. But I'm grateful. She stared back at the pile and said, would you like me to exchange these then? Yes please. And could you open a bank account for me to store the valis? I mean, I love carrying around a ton of gold as much as the next guy, but dash. I already did. Inna reached into her pocket and flicked a silver card towards me. I caught it and examined it. The card was simple, just silver with my name etched on it. But there was magic floating around inside. You can use that to withdraw funds downstairs at a teller or in Babel at the exchange hall. Thanks Inna. Love you. Inna rolled her eyes. Your sweet words won't make me less annoyed, Belle. She shook her head and smiled. But A for effort. I smiled back and scratched my cheek. Now then. Is this it? You don't intend to go into the dungeon again after this, do you? Nope. I'm planning on getting some proper gear. I frowned and said, somehow, I've got a feeling that I'll need it with my luck. The dungeon seemed pretty adamant about killing off the little birdie. Not only that, but I definitely drained its resources by murdering those monsters. Something that it probably didn't expect considering the last time I went inside. Though it also seemed to be smart, so I didn't want to risk it getting desperate and sending something like the Reaper from Persona after me. Inna gave me a blank stare and said, I'm surprised you're still alive all things considered. She glanced at my outfit and said, Are you sure you don't want me to get you a set of the guild-issued armor? E.R. No offense, but I think I'll need better stuff. And I also want to try something first. Like getting a giant set of plat email and becoming a literal tank blasting projectiles. Fine. Just don't die. If you do, I'm going to make a public obituary about the cocky adventurer who thought he knew everything and dropped dead. I laughed. Well, looks like I can't die anytime soon then, can I? In a side. You're insufferable. Yes. And thankfully not in suffering. Inna's eye twitched and she let out a deep sigh. 
Well then, if that's all dash. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Inna narrowed her eyes and said, what is it this time? I glanced to my shoulder and let the little bird out of my inventory. Cheep. It blinked and looked at me. Cheep cheep. Inna froze. I pointed at my new friend and said, this guy followed me out of the dungeon. He's harmless and pretty weak, so I felt bad leaving him in such a dangerous place. I didn't read any laws against keeping monsters and I read that there were a few tamers out there, but I was wondering if you knew any specifics. Hello? Inna. Inna blinked and then lowered her glasses, cleaning them on her shirt. After putting them on, she stared at the bird and then looked at me, groaning. Of course. You would be the first person to tame a jack bird. Cheeb. Chapter 14, Is It Wrong to Try and Forcibly Evolve My Pet? After showing my new friend to Inna, we had an emergency extended meeting to discuss the little guy. Cheep cheep. The tiny golden bird, or rather, the jack bird was sitting on Inna's desk in front of me. Inna stared at it in wonder and then shook her head. I still can't believe it. You either have the best luck in the world, or the worst. I scratched the bird's head, getting some cute coos in response, and then said, what's the problem? Is it dangerous? No. Inna shook her head. Jack birds might be monsters, but they're the least dangerous monsters in existence. So why is it such a big deal? Inna sighed. Because no one in the history of Orario has tamed one. She paused. Or maybe they did and kept it secret. Either way. This is trouble. She straightened and said, Belle. I know you want to protect it, but as your advisor, I'm telling you to release the jack bird. That, or kill it. The bird froze, starting to tremble beneath my hand. I gently patted it. Don't worry little guy. I won't kill you. Ch Cheeb. The bird turned to look at me, pleading with its rainbow eyes. Cheeb. Yeah, I promise. Inna blinked and said, you can understand it. What? I laughed. Of course not. It's a bird. But it can understand me. Can it? As if annoyed, the bird looked at Inna and started cheeping. Cheep. Cheep cheep cheep. Che cheep. Inna smiled at the bird's antics. But then she sighed. Even so. If you don't want to kill it, you should still release it, Belle. The situation might be different if you were in the Freya Familia, but otherwise, it's too dangerous. I frowned. Inna specifically mentioned the Freya Familia, meaning that it would only be safe if I was in the strongest familia in Orario. Did the bird sense my concern? It trembled and nuzzled against me. I patted my little friend's head to calm it down and then said, you still didn't explain why. Because the jackbird's drop item of a golden egg is guaranteed and worth a million valis. I froze. The bird did as well. And then it twittered, something like a nervous laugh. Ch cheep. Inna stared at the bird and frowned. I haven't heard of a jackbird being this small, or this pure golden color, but there's no doubt about it. While the larger familia might not care dash. Basically everyone else and their mother will try to get their hands on this little ball of sunshine here. I frowned. It was basically a golden goose. And while the drop item was guaranteed on kill, since it was an egg, and since birds laid eggs every now and then anyway, if the little guy stuck around, it was inevitable I'd get one eventually. And probably a rarer one considering the little guy seemed to be a variant. The tiny bird turned around to look at me. I stared back at it. The golden bird was so tiny. It probably was just a baby, barely knowing anything about the world. No, it definitely didn't know anything considering how delighted it had been at seeing everything around. If I let it go. I was sure. It would die right away. Monsters coveted it, and adventurers would too for that amount of money. Cheep. It tilted its head, as if wondering what I was thinking. Bell. I stared at the little guy and then sighed. After that, I smiled and picked it up. Ch cheep. It's fine. I placed it back on my shoulder and looked to Inna. Thanks for the advice, Inna. And thanks for the worry. But. I shook my head. I can't. Cheep. The bird let out a happy trill and then nudged its head against me. I smiled and rubbed its chin with my finger. Inna sighed. I should have expected it. She smiled and said, I had a feeling you were that sort of person. In that case, 
Should I register you as a tamer then? Do I have to? In a post. You don't. But in that case, if something happens the guild can't intervene to help you. In that case, please do. I laughed and said, I've got a feeling I'll need all the help I can get. Inna nodded. It'll be public record, but it won't be thrown out there for the world to see. If you're planning on keeping it, I suggest doing what you did the first time to hide it. Mm. I nodded. We'll work something out. Right little guy. Cheeb. The bird let out a happy trill and then nodded its head. In a side. Well. Since you've given me all this information, I've got a lot of work to do now, Belle. She frowned and said, I might actually be busy for the next few days actually filing all that paperwork. That's fine. Guess I'll just take another break from the dungeon for a while. Inna paused and then shook her head. You don't have to wait on me. I'll admit that you've had a string of bad luck, but so long as you don't go too far, it should be fine to go into the dungeon. Just don't be stupid and try to rush to the 11th floor or something. Yes, mother. Inna rolled her eyes and then walked to the door. Take care Belle. And be careful. Always. I stood up and motioned for the little guy to head back into my inventory, or what was turning out to be more than just a simple inventory. It did, turning into that weird hologram form and then hopped back on my shoulder. She opened it for me and ushered me out. Triple X. Back on the streets in Orario, I walked around, lost in thought. You're a heck of a lot of trouble, aren't you, little guy? I muttered under my breath. Cheeb. Nah, it's fine. Can't be helped being born so weak. But in that case, we'll probably need to put you through some training. Right now I'm scared that I'll accidentally hurt you or something, and it's probably better if you can get away from sticky situations by yourself too. Cheeb. Though I can't just keep calling you little guy all the time. Are you even a guy? Cheeb. I leaned against the side of a building and glanced at the bird, mumbling under my breath to disguise my chatter. Or are you a girl? Cheeb. I blinked. So a girl. Cheep cheep. The bird nodded. Hearing that, I laughed. Well. Belle did want to pick up chicks in a dungeon. Hell of a way to fulfill that dream. He probably wasn't expecting it to be literal. Alrighty. Then we need a name for you. You're too cute and beautiful to be called something as ugly as your species, so. How about Fina? The golden colors and royal monocolor reminded me of that famous fire bird. A phoenix. And Fina was just short of that. A happy trill echoed beside me and I saw the bird. Fina rapidly nodding its. Her head. Cheep. Cheep cheep. She nudged her head against me, clearly happy. I laughed. All right. With that settled. I guess I should give you a grand tour of the place, hi. I pushed myself off the wall and started walking. I need to scope this place out more anyway, so it's a good a time as any. Ah, and I need to get more groceries too. Cheeb. I placed my hand on my chin to think, but then I heard a voice call out to me. Bell. Hmm. I turned to look and saw Hestia waving at me from behind a wooden stall with an array of potato snacks. No, Jagamericans. I waved and walked over. Heya, Tia. Didn't expect to run into you. I glanced at the stall and said, so this is where you work. MMHM. She smiled and said, I'm working hard. I glanced at the unopened lunchbox beside her and frowned. Hard enough to forget to eat lunch, I see. She blushed and said, I was just about to eat. I it's not like I forgot or anything. I laughed. It's fine. I noticed a few people were staring at us. No, at me. Their gazes flitted back and forth between me and Hestia and talked in whispers. Hestia noticed and started to frown. Cheeb. Fina looked confused. I glanced at Fina and smiled before rummaging around in my bag for some coins. Here. I placed a gold coin on the stall and said, since you've been eating my cooking for a while, it's only fair that I get some of yours, right? How about something fresh? Hestia's eyes widened and she looked uncertain. I. But Belle, I'm not as good dash. It's fine. I just want to enjoy my cute and adorable goddess's personal cooking. Hestia blushed at that and fidgeted. Belle. At the same time, 
I could see other people staring again. This time though, I got a lot of male attention. Jealous male attention. I chuckled. Hestia didn't seem to notice. After my words, she was fired up and quickly went to work. Freshly peeled potato, cut into slices. Light breading, then into a vat of boiling oil. Carefully spreading on some sugar and cream. Here you go. Hestia beamed and handed me the Jag American in a paper wrapper. A fresh Jag American from your goddess. I made a dramatic flourish and took it from her. Oh thank you, my dear goddess. Now my sunken energy stores will be restored. Hestia laughed and then stared at me with a bright smile on her face. You silly guy. Only for you. I took a bite of the potato snack. It was, pretty good. Definitely unhealthy, but really tasty. Despite looking like a hash brown, it actually tasted like funnel cake. Hestia blushed again and then said, What are you doing here anyway? I thought you wanted to go to the dungeon today. I did, but I felt my limit coming up so I decided to head back. Besides, I was starting to get hungry, and eating in the dungeon is such a buzz kill. Hestia shook her head. Don't take it lightly. The dungeon is dangerous. I know. Which is why I'm taking a few more days off to prepare before going deeper. Good. Hestia smiled. And remember to take your time. I don't mind working longer if it means that you're safe. A soft declaration with firm resolve in her eyes. It was easy to brush off her words, but I didn't. Instead, I smiled and nodded. Thank you. It's the least I can do as your goddess. Hestia lowered her gaze and mumbled. My smile widened and I patted her head. And you're doing more than enough by being there for me, Tia. Your love definitely gives me the courage to keep moving forward in this world. It wasn't a lie. If I was just by myself in a random familia, I wouldn't be working as hard. But knowing that Tia was waiting for me and that she sincerely liked me. L love. Hestia turned a bright red. WW what are you talking about? I laughed and waved. I'll see you at home, Tia. You you. I took another bite of the Jag American, feeling light-hearted. Now. Back to preparations. Triple X. Cheeb. Fina sat on the table, staring at me. I was back in the church now, the trip back home being very uneventful. I thought about heading out to go shopping, but there was a more important issue to settle first. Which brought me to the current situation, Fina sitting on the table with me sitting at the chair in front of her. We need to make you stronger. Cheeb. Fina tilted her head. Right now, you're fast and good at running away, but that's it. You saw it yourself, right? If not for me, you would have been monster food. Fina shuddered and then nodded. Cheeb. I'll let you know right now. There are tons of people out there much stronger than me. Faster too. Cheeb. Fina looked like she didn't believe me. It's a big world, you know? And while I have those trump cards, you never know just what they have in store. My ace was shooting projectiles at insane speeds through physics manipulation and munchkin logic, but it was still just pure physics. When magic and skills came into the equation, crazy things could happen. Like maybe a shield that completely stopped kinetic energy. I could see it. And knowing my luck, I'd probably run into something like that too. Things might be different if I could be like the King of Heroes and create a vault of magical and legendary armaments or like the nameless counter guardian who could create copies of said magical and legendary armaments, but I wasn't there yet. Maybe in the future when I racked up more funds and skills, but definitely not now. But those were concerns for later. Right now, I had to help Fina out. Hmm. She was technically a monster, so if she was to get stronger, it would probably have to be in the way monsters did. And from what I remembered from my reading, mostly from one of the gruesome deaths in the readings, a monster could grow stronger by eating magic stones. So. Hey. I pulled out a magic stone and held it out to her. Can you eat this? Cheeb. Fina looked at the magic stone and then shook her head. Cheeb. Cheep cheep. She pecked on the magic stone and then waved a wing at herself. Oh right. The stone was basically the size of her head. In that case. Here, open your mouth. Fina gave me a skeptical look, glancing at the magic stone. I rolled my eyes. No, I'm not going to shove it in. 
But if we want to make you stronger, I do need to feed you some magic stones. I've got a way to do it though. I think. Fina still looked unsure, but she nodded and then opened her beak, showing a cute pink tongue. When she did, I focused. Energy manipulation. That was one of my developmental abilities. And from what I knew about those now, they were abilities that let you do things. Like how a blacksmith got better at blacksmithing with that developmental ability, energy manipulation should let me manipulate energy. I had a vague sense of it. Even before getting my fauna, I could vaguely use energy manipulation, or something like it. After all, I could sense mana from adventurers and divinity before I became part of Hestia's familia. But now that ability had been amplified, refined. I could see it. The way that Tia's divine essence in my body drew out my powers and refined it. A guiding hand, nudging me towards the best way to act, while at the same time adding something more to the action. Was it the power of story itself being added? Or experience? Either way, I let that guiding hand aid me and focused on the task at hand. Fina was weak. Too weak. So I wanted to make her stronger. Monsters increased their strength by devouring magic stones. But why? Was it simply increasing the total amount of mana? No. It was probably due to that. A magic stone was the core essence of a monster. Without it, the monster vanished. Like a heart, only more important. Similar to how dragons in some stories were said to have a heart of hearts that stored their soul. Thus, when a monster devoured another monster's core, it gained that monster's essence and power. In that way, monsters could grow and upgrade based on the characteristics of the magic stone they devoured. But it was no good for Fina to grow from devouring goblin and cobalt monster stones. It might help, but my intuition told me those energies would inevitably hold her back in the future. An incompatibility that would lead to a distorted growth. Then, I grabbed a handful of magic stones and pulled them apart. Energy manipulation unraveled the monster cores and revealed to me the pattern within. Was it because they were weak monsters? It was simple, mostly just jumpy for the goblin and smashy for the cobalt, if that made sense. But that wasn't any good. What Fina needed was strength, resilience, and pure energy. Characteristics that lined up with the phoenix she reminded me of. Unfortunately, I didn't have any magic stones that would have those properties. So I used the next best thing. Carefully examining the magic stone patterns and referencing my own mana and fauna, I carefully pulled out a piece and used it as the base. Then, drawing in ambient mana and the pure energy in the magic stone, I started to refine it. My mana was weird in comparison to other things. Maybe due to my quantum magic, it had a shimmery feel around it, like an optical illusion. Something that changed form depending on how you looked at it. As a result, when it mixed with the ambient mana and the purified energy I drew out from the magic stone, it changed. Tighter, brighter, more condensed. Like turning coal into diamonds, everything I gathered slowly came together and changed form. Not only that, but the faint traces of Tia's power mixed in with the ambient mana and lent it more weight. In the end. There we go. I was left with a tiny glittering bead of pure energy. It was a curious color. Pure white, with a flickering blue flame in the middle of it. It was also more energy than I was comfortable holding, admittedly. But it should be safe for Fina to use, especially if I was here to help her process it. With that, I carefully placed the bead into her beak. Fina raised her head up and swallowed. And then she froze. Fina. My eyes widened and I focused, using energy manipulation to see what was going on. Ch Cheeb. 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 Fina started to chirp and then screech, running around. It looked painful. Her cute little face was distorted in misery. I placed my hand on her and said, Hold on, Fina. It's painful, but it'll be worth it. Fight. Ch Sheeb. Fina screeched again, but this time she curled up into my hand, as if deriving comfort from that. And when she did, I saw it. Her magic stone was cracking. My eyes widened. Did I miscalculate? I thought that giving her the most energy would be good and that she would be able to handle it, but it seemed like I overestimated her capacity. No, I forgot. While I was perfectly capable of handling ridiculous feats to my body, others weren't. Damn it. At this rate, her stone would shatter and she would die. Not only that, it'd be a painful and miserable death too. 
But I wouldn't allow that. I focused. Magic stone. Mana. Energy. Fina's issue was that her magic stone couldn't handle what I gave her. And she couldn't spit it out either. The problem was a matter of purity. Like how a hotter flame would subsume a smaller flame, her magic stone wasn't a match for the bead of energy I gave her. The pure energy was cracking it because the magic stone wasn't strong enough. So I had to make it stronger. I stared at the threads of energy and scanned through my mind. I couldn't refine her magic stone. I didn't dare risk that. It was basically her soul, and anything wrong with that would be unforgivable. But we needed to deal with that energy somehow. Her soul wasn't strong enough. My initial idea was correct though. I could see bits of her magic stone adapting, turning a brilliant pure white. But those were too far and few, and the stone was already cracked. So I had to fix it. A means to offload the energy until her core adapted and evolved. I racked my mind and then I remembered it. A bridge between the soul and the physical body to serve as a medium to magical power. Magic circuits. I quickly went to work on it. A loop, directing the excess energy. Offloading the extraneous flow to other parts of her body. Creating new channels, pathways, cycles. No, it wasn't enough. Her body lacked those features to use. It was too simple. After all, she was just a tiny bird. I couldn't even offload it into her bones, since they were hollow. Then I had to add things. Change her body. It was already trying to adapt. I could see the magic stone pulsing and letting out waves of energy to try and adjust. Then. A nervous system. A circulatory system. Respiratory system. Digestive system. Blood, flesh, sinew. Macro system, micro system. Individual cells, organs, organelles. Flashes of half-remembered memories from college and high school biology filled my mind, mixed with the anatomy knowledge of various monsters that I read in the books in a handed me. After that, diagrams from electrical engineering course I had taken came to mind. The flow of energy, adjusting for pressure and voltage. This wasn't electricity, but the concepts were the same. So then. Carefully, painstakingly, meticulously. I constantly monitored the flow of energy. And finally. It was over. Fina placed her head against the table, unconscious from the fatigue. Hi. Good idea. A nap sounds. Chapter 15, Is it wrong to have a daughter with my goddess? Bell? Are you home? Hestia unlatched the iron gate and then walked towards the church. Looking around, she didn't see a sign of Bell, which was odd, considering it was still light out. After Bell left, Hestia got a lot of customers. But it was getting a bit too much to handle, so she closed up shop and ran away. She also wanted to spend some time with Bell and grill him about what he did in the dungeon. Her intuition was telling her that he did something ridiculous again, or got wrapped up in something ridiculous. But he wasn't outside, so. Is he sleeping? Did the dungeon take that much out of him? Hestia frowned and then closed the gate behind her. After that, she walked inside the church. Bell. No response. However, she could feel his presence and hear light breathing, but it was coming from the kitchen. Hestia sighed and walked over to it. After lighting a lantern, she turned towards the table and said, Bell, you shouldn't dash. Her words frozen in her throat. Bell was fine. He looked like he had just passed out at the table. Considering how hard he trained and worked, Hestia didn't find that odd. But what she did find odd was what? No, who he had fallen asleep nearby. On the table, curled up naked and hugging Belle's outstretched arm, was a young girl. One that couldn't have been more than five years old. And that was putting it at the high end. Hestia's mind froze. Did Belle kidnap the girl? No, he wasn't that type of person. But, he did seem to be a natural gigolo like my ache and take. Did that girl follow him home? No, even then she wouldn't have been naked. So why was she naked? Did he fall victim to his lesser desires and eat the little girl? No, no, no. If that was the case, then Hestia would have been eaten a long time ago. Then? While the gears in Hestia's mind spluttered, the young girl started to move. Hestia froze, staring at the girl. She let out a cute yawn and then rubbed her eyes. Raising her head, she looked at Hestia and blinked. 
and when Hestia saw the girl's face, she let out a sharp gasp. One eye was a sparkling crimson color, the exact same shade as Belle's. But the other was a color that Hestia knew well. A pure shade of blue that was the same as the pair she saw in the mirror every morning. But more than that was the girl's face. The hair color was all Belle's. A pure white that looked like spun moonlight. But that face. It was a bit different, but it was still the same. One that Hestia knew very well. Hers. The young girl tilted her head and then carefully said, Mama. 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 Her. And Belle. And such a cute little girl. Hestia screamed. Triple X. I snapped awake and jumped up to my feet. On instinct, I reached for my knife and looked around. It was a scream. Tia's scream. But my mind was still too groggy to process it. There were three people here. One was me. The other was Tia. The last was, a weird mix that felt like, me and Tia. Eh? Before I could figure out what was happening, a cute voice spoke up. Papa. W8. You can't hug him like that. Eh? Why not, Mama? You need clothes. Clothes? What are those? There. Arg, just come here. I'll get you changed. Okay, Mama. A flurry of footsteps, followed by a door slamming shut. I felt like I just heard a ridiculous conversation right now, so I focused, trying to wake up. But it was hard. I just felt so drained. I shook my head and placed my hand on my forehead, trying to stave off a headache that was starting. Just what the heck did I do? It was dark out, so it was still the middle of the night. But what happened before then? I frowned and ran my memories back. Training in the dungeon, fighting off those monsters, meeting Fina, talking with Ina, visiting Tia at her work, coming back, and then... Oh yeah. I did something stupid trying to help Fina and then did everything I could to save her. Speaking of Fina. Daddy. Before I could gather my thoughts further, a white flash appeared and hugged me. I blinked and looked down. A young girl was standing there, a bright smile on her face. Wearing a white dress a few sizes too big for her. She looked super cute. Especially with her pure white hair and heterochrome eyes, one red and one blue. She also looked familiar. Really familiar. Hold on. White hair. Red eye. One blue eye. Hestia ran over, carrying a candle to light up the room. H hey. Don't run away like that. The girl looked back at Hestia and frowned. But Daddy's awake. My mind froze. Daddy? Hestia sighed. Even so, he's probably really confused right now. At least, I know I am. The girl blinked and said, Mommy's confused. Mommy. I rigidly turned my head towards Hestia. When I looked to her and then the girl. I could see the resemblance. There was no way you could mistake the girl as anything other than Hestia's daughter. But she wasn't just Hestia's daughter. That hair color, and that eye. Then how her mana was a mix of my own and Tia's divinity. Since when did? No, I didn't, right? Even if I slept with Tia, I never slept with Tia. Did I? Or did I attack her in the middle of the night? I mean, she was cuddly and it was really tempting sleeping next to her, but I would never. Hestia's eyes widened. Belle. This isn't what it looks like. So this girl's not our daughter. I turned to look at her. Yet. Yeah. Impossible. She looked way too much like me and Tia to not be our kid. But how in the hell? The little girl's face fell. I'm not daddy and mommy's child. Of course you are. Hestia quickly ran up and pulled the girl into her arm. Mommy won't ever let you go. The girl immediately brightened up and hugged Hestia. Thank you. Love you, mommy. Hestia turned red and then hugged the girl tighter, practically beaming with happiness. But that still didn't answer my question. I could set it aside for now. More importantly. I couldn't see Fina anywhere. I frowned and said, Tia. Did you see a little bird around here? Hestia blinked and looked back at me. A bird. MMHM. I nodded and said, she's gold and pretty small. Just about the size of my palm. She answers to Fina. Hestia frowned and shook her head. But the girl's eyes lit up. 
Oh. I'm right here, Daddy. Eh? I blinked. The girl frowned and said, that hurt a lot but now I look like Daddy. And I have a mommy now too. Eh? W wait. You're Fina. The girl. No, Fina nodded. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Daddy. Yeah, I'm out. D Daddy. Bell? Bell. Triple X. I blinked, greeted with sunlight filtering in through a nearby window. As always, Hestia was sleeping beside me, hugging my arm. I smiled when I saw that and carefully untangled myself from her. As I did though, I frowned. What a weird dream. To think that I would imagine having a daughter with Tia. What did you dream about, Daddy? A lovely cute voice echoed from off to the side. On the couch nearby. I froze and then turned towards it. And there she was. The cute and adorable young girl with white hair the same color as mine as well as a face that looked too much like Tia's to be anything but her daughter. Her daughter that she had with me. Except she couldn't be. Fina. Uh huh. The girl nodded her head and then frowned. You and mommy slept for a long time. Were you that tired? I felt a headache start, but I nodded. Something like that. But you're really Fina? The little bird I took with me from the dungeon. The girl nodded. Yep. But I'm not a bird now. I can talk, and I have arms, and I can hug mommy and daddy. To emphasize that, she hopped off the couch and ran over to hug me, nestling her head against my chest. Ah. So this is how Inna feels. An utterly ridiculous revelation that just had to be dealt with and couldn't be brushed under the rug. Yeah. That was a massive headache all right. Hmm. Nothing, Fina. No, sweetie. Princess? Princess. Fina gasped. I'm a princess. I laughed and patted her head. To me you are. Though. How did this happen? I dunno. But I'm happy. She grinned and then stepped back, spinning. Free, free. And I can talk now too. We. An adorable sight. She was just like any other toddler. Except she wasn't really. Or was she? My head hurt. M.M. Hestia stirred and then sat up, rubbing her eyes. When she saw me, she blushed. Be Bell. Good morning. Morning Tia. She frowned and said, I had the strangest dream dash. Mommy. Fina ran over and hugged her. Morning. Ah. Hestia blinked and robotically hugged Fina back. Gee good morning. Fina let out a bright smile and then pulled her up. Come on. Let's go play with daddy. Hestia smiled. That sounds lovely, sweetie. Be but I think I need to talk to Belle. I mean your daddy first. After that, she sent me a sharp glare. I coughed. Oh. Okay. Fina frowned and lowered her head. Seeing that, Hestia flinched and hugged Fina. It'll only be for a little bit, okay? Why don't you go look for something to eat in the meanwhile? I should have some Jagamericans in my bag. Okay. Fina nodded and then skipped away, heading towards the bag Hestia pointed at. After that, Hestia stood up and pointed at the office room. Talk. Now. I let out a wry smile. Triple X. Explain. Hestia crossed her arms and said, Who is that girl, and why does she look like she could be our daughter? I shifted my gaze and said, what? Is that a bad thing? No. But. Conflicted emotions passed across Hestia's face, and then she glared at me. I need answers. I sighed. Well. I'm not too sure how this came about myself, but I'll do my best. I explained to Tia about how I found Fina in the dungeon. And then I talked about how I was worried and tried to make her stronger. As for the end result. I'm not sure. I placed my hand on my chin and said, I guess she has my hair color and one eye red because I used my mana to strengthen her. But I don't know why she looks like you. Maybe because of this place. The ambient mana I used had traces of Hestia's divinity, so maybe that affected Fina's growth? Hestia frowned. So that girl is a monster. She was. Now though. I frowned and glanced out of the room. Fina was twirling around in the courtyard enjoying the sunlight and staring at everything with wonder. More importantly though, 
I didn't sense a magic stone from her anymore. The only thing I could sense was that her mana was a mix of mine and Hestia's. Not divine though. Instead, it was, holy. Pure. Blessed. Almost divine, but a step removed from it. Maybe she's a spirit now? No, I don't think she's a whole spirit, so a demi-spirit? Demi-goddess. Fina was definitely half of me and Tia, so, something like that. Hestia blinked and then let out a deep suffering sigh. This is going to cause a lot of problems. Hmm? How so? How is it not? Hestia huffed and pointed at Fina. She looks like our daughter. No, my daughter. There's no way anyone looking at her won't think otherwise. And she thinks we're her parents too. And? It would be a hassle. I definitely needed to speed up that plan of getting things ready to properly marry Tia. Ah, wait. I never even took her on a date. Gotta get that squared away too. Then talk to Anna about marriage licenses, then. And both gods and spirits can't have children, Belle. Wait, what? I frowned. They can't. Demigods were a thing though. Especially for Greek gods like Hestia. Hell, look at Zeus and Poseidon. Yes. We can't. A vehement denial. And coming from a goddess herself, it was probably true. But that didn't make sense. Unless it was because it was forbidden like in Percy Jackson for the Big Three? No, I would definitely have read about that in the law books. And the way Tia denied it sounded more like it was a physical impossibility rather than a forbidden one. Which didn't make sense considering that Tia definitely had a human body. But. Well, I'd take her word for it right now. Hestia sighed again and face palmed. We'll just have to pass it off as a coincidence. Not sure if anyone will believe it, but since it's impossible, they'll have to believe it. I'm sorry, Tia. Don't apologize. Hestia snapped and said, I'm not sure how that child came to be, but since she sees you as her father, I won't forgive you if you treat her wrong. Well, you're the mommy here, so I guess I'll listen. I let out a teasing smile. Hestia rolled her eyes and then turned to look at Fina. Still. She let out a soft smile and said, she's beautiful. I followed her gaze and couldn't help but nod. A pure and innocent young girl, playing and laughing beneath the sunlight. Did she sense us staring at her? Fina paused and turned towards the window, smiling. She jumped up and waved. So what do we do now? I glanced at Hestia and said, I'm not sure if you can sense it, but her mana radiates your power. That was a problem. Hestia groaned. I know. But thankfully, we can fix it. We can. Hestia smiled. Yep. We just have to become a real family. Eh. Chapter 16, Is it wrong to have such an op cute daughter? Wow. Fina looked at her back in a nearby mirror and then turned to look at me. We match, daddy. Why yet? I guess we do. The basement room of the church. Away from any prying windows. There, Tia decided to update my status and give one to Fina to avoid any misconceptions. Or rather, to make a misconception. It was a smart move. Now that Fina had a fauna, the part of her that felt like Tia blended in with the blessing she got from the fauna. Of course, that still left the awkward question of why she looked almost exactly like Tia. But it should be fine. Maybe. Hopefully. Of course, we had an issue. Both with my status and Fina's. Triple X. Bell Cranal. LV1. Strength, H100. Endurance, H100. Dexterity, H100. Agility, H100. Magic, H100. Energy Manipulation, G. Compilation, G. Magic. Quantum Magic, Instant Magic. Inventory, Auto Magic. Skills. Liar's Phrase, Reality is nothing more than the lies we tell. Growth is determined according to the user's will. External influences are subsumed and overridden. Storyteller's Refrain, allows the user to impart a portion of their experiences onto another. Triple X. First, my status. The stat-ups were expected, so they weren't too big a deal. But the troubling parts were my magic and skills. First off, it looked like inventory was counted as a magic. The thing was, it was auto-magic, meaning it was always on. That was rare in and of itself. 
but there was the fact that it was freaking called inventory. If anybody saw it, wouldn't they know that I can store items? The heck! Not only that, but there was that new skill. Letting me impart a portion of my experiences. Didn't that just mean I could give Exilia to people without them having to work for it? If word got out, all of Orario would be after me. But not only that. Triple X. Fina Cranal. LV1. Strength, I0. Endurance, I0. Dexterity, I0. Agility, I0. Magic, I0. Mystery, I. Luck, I. Magic. Spirit Body, Auto Magic. Resurrection, Auto Magic. Phoenix Fire, Instant Magic. Skills. Vesta, Spirit of Everlasting Flame, Grants Dominion Over Fire. Grants Instant Regeneration. Triple X. Fina was listed as my actual daughter. Or at least a blood relative. I mean, what else could having my last name mean, right? And then there were her development abilities of mystery and luck, three magics that sounded incredibly broken, and then there was her skill which doubled down on those magics. Hestia let out a rigid laugh and said, Why you really inherited a lot from us, didn't you, Fina? Did I? Yay. Fina pumped her tiny fist in the air and said, I'm like mommy and daddy. I sighed. You sure are, princess. Though, daddy realizes now just what a hassle he must be to others. I really needed to give Anna an apology gift. Hmm. Fina tilted her head. Nothing, princess. I put my shirt back on and looked at Hestia. Are you going to take her to work with you, Tia? Or should I watch her? Hestia frowned. I don't know if that's a good idea. And don't you have things to do, Belle? I do, but it'll be awkward for you, won't it? Hestia bit her lips. It will. But it'll be the same for you. Yeah. That was true. Especially if I ran across someone like Anna. Fina put her shirt on as well and then looked between us. Am I a bother? No. Never. Hestia and I responded at the same time. Fina flinched and then lowered her head. But. Mommy and Daddy look upset. It's because of me, isn't it? Fina's eyes started to glisten. I quickly stood up to hug her, but Hestia was faster. It's not that, sweetie. Hestia brushed Fina's hair and said, Mommy and Daddy just weren't expecting you. But that doesn't mean we don't care about you. Right, Belle. I nodded. Right. We just have to sort out who will watch you when we're working. I frowned and muttered, after all, I don't think I want to be that guy dragging a child into the dungeon. Even if she's ridiculous enough to not get hurt. Fina sniffed, and then she turned to look at me. But. I don't want Daddy to go alone. It's dangerous down there. Hestia nodded. It is. And because of that, I don't want my sweet little girl to go either. But. I know. I looked at the girls and said, why don't we do this? Fina can help you out with selling the Jagamericans until noon while I sort out my affairs and then I'll take her back for lunch. Is that okay? Hestia frowned. Won't it be hard to go into the dungeon for so short a time? I waved my hand. It's fine. I'm taking it slow anyway. I looked at Fina. How does that sound, princess? Do you mind going with mommy to her work for a while? Fina frowned. Promise that daddy won't go do anything dangerous. I'll promise to try. Fina's frown grew deeper, but she slowly nodded. Okay. But I want a sweet. Sweet. Fina nodded. I saw crystal candies on our way back. Daddy has to get me some. I laughed and walked over to ruffle her hair. Fine, fine. Daddy will get you some candy. Okay. I glanced at Hestia and said, in that case. You should probably get going, right? Hestia sighed. But then she put on a smile and picked Fina up. Come on, sweetie. Let's have a girl's day out and get to know each other, okay? Yay. Triple X. Crystal candies, hi. I sighed and ran my hand through my hair. Well, I gotta make sure to get that too. After Hestia left with Fina, I decided to go around sorting out what I had to do. After the mess of yesterday, I really wasn't in the mood for dungeon diving. 
Was this how a guy felt when he found out that the girl he was interested in suddenly got pregnant after a one-night stand and had to man up? Granted, I was sure I didn't have a one-night stand with Tia and Fina wasn't born like that, but... Hi. Yeah, in hindsight this looked pretty bad. Definitely needed to speed up the whole get strong and famous plan. But before all of that, preparations. Let's see. I walked over to the pantry to check what we needed, made a note of what to get, and then walked out of the church, making sure to close everything up behind me. After that, I headed towards the marketplace. Or rather, that was what I originally planned. But since it wasn't too far from the church in the first place, I decided to head to Babel first. It was about time that I started to sort through equipment. Proper equipment. After all, I made a decent amount of valis. So, with that in mind, I walked off. I noticed that there was a bit of a commotion in the direction of Hestia's stall as I passed around the corner, but I pointedly ignored it for the moment. I wasn't a coward. I just knew where and when to fight my battles, and to delegate trouble to people who could handle it better than I could. Not to mention that my presence would probably cause an even bigger commotion. So I avoided that mess and continued on my way. The rest of my walk was uneventful though, and I arrived at Babel without a hitch. After withdrawing some money with my card, roughly 10k valis, I used the elevator and headed up to the weapon and armor shops on the higher levels. Inside the elevator, I stared at the buttons and recalled the info about the shops that I read. Let's see. The Hephaestus Familia has shops on the 4th through 8th floor. The upper floors probably have the better goods, so, let's start with the 4th. I pressed the 4th floor button and waited. In terms of equipment, my knife was still good, so I didn't need that. What I needed was armor. As for what armor? If I remembered right, Bell used light armor and a chest plate. But he was fast and light, able to dodge. I wasn't. Well, not as fast. I was still pretty fast, but not zoom across the floor and walls fast. Besides that, I also wanted to test something out. I didn't have any proper weights, but plate armor was a thing. Apparently, it wasn't super heavy, but it would still be decent enough to do a workout in. Not only that, but I really needed defense power. Vision wasn't an issue with me since I could see with energy manipulation, so a full helmet was probably best. Then. The elevator door opened. When it did, it immediately opened to a desk. There was a man seated behind it, buff, scarred, the typical blacksmith type. He looked at me and said, Welcome. Looking for anything in particular. I glanced around at the various mounted swords and weapons and said, Armor. Preferably full plate. Full plate, eh. He looked at me and then nodded. Mm. Got a budget. I looked back at him and said, Anything good for under 10k? His face fell. 10k. Hmm. He rubbed his chin and sighed. If you're looking for plat email. I don't think so. Decent quality runs around 30k. You could probably get a few pieces, but... Ah. Right, a full set would be pretty pricey. He looked at me and then hummed. Well, if you don't mind the quality, you could always take a look in the back. Saying that, he pointed to the corner. I blinked. The back. Yeah. Some of our new smiths put their work there. Maybe you'll find enough pieces in your range. In short. He was telling me to dig through the discount bin. If you're just looking for something like a chest plate though dash. That's fine. I nodded and said, I'll take a look. Suit yourself. He shrugged and sat back down. When he did, I walked over to the corner. Like the guy said, there were a bunch of armor pieces lying around. Most of them were a mess. Failures that I could instantly tell weren't up to snuff. Greaves that were too thin and brittle. Chest plates that were crooked and uneven. I glanced through the shelves and walked further, carefully scanning the armor. A few were good, but not what I wanted. Others were up my alley, but didn't fit me. Damn it. This was the problem with trying to buy stock equipment. Just as I was about to give up, I saw it. A full armor set, tucked in the back corner. It was sleek, but bulky. Almost like a mech suit. Black steel. No, it was lead. A full set of lead plat email, using steel to support the base frame but lead for defensive protection. Curious, I went over to pick up the vam brace. Heavy. 
on its own, not much, but when taking into account that the armor was meant to be worn while moving. I could see why it was tucked away. Something like this was impractical. A person able to wear it would probably be strong enough to afford better quality armor that could provide the same protection while being lighter. For practical purposes, it was. Not trash. I could see that the maker intended to have it be proper armor and was testing out an idea. But the execution was flawed. Something like this would have been better done with a stronger base frame and then a lighter exterior. Still, for my purposes, it worked perfectly. I didn't plan to use it in the dungeon beyond the first five floors anyway, but on those levels it'd be more than enough to face tank all the attacks. Not only that, but it looked cool. Call it a man's passion? I picked up the display card showing the information about the maker and the price. Price. It was 10k for the full set. A severe underprice for the materials, but since it was impractical for the average adventurer, it was reasonable. As for the maker. Welf Crosso. I frowned. The name seemed familiar. But I couldn't remember why. Still, I memorized it. The craftsmanship and idea behind the armor was really good. Granted, the execution was flawed, but the guy had good taste and decent skills. I'd have to remember to hunt him down later when I had more money for a proper armor commission. What do you mean you put it in the corner? A shout echoed from the front of the room. I blinked and turned around. There, I saw the receptionist arguing with a young man that had red hair. He wore a blue scarf and a black tunic. There was a giant sword strapped to his back. And he looked angry enough to use it. Almost, anyway. The shopkeeper huffed. Did you really think anyone would buy that failure? Black Demon isn't a failure. It's meant to provide defensive power while dash. While being too damned heavy for any person to wear. The man slammed his fist on the table and said, Get it through your head, you brat. If you're planning to sell things in Lady Hephaestus's shop, they have to be usable. You're lucky I even allowed it here at all. It is usable. And just you wait, I bet it's going to sell in the week. Ha! Huh. If that happens I'll eat my dash. I coughed. The man behind the counter scowled and said, Look, you're disturbing the customer. Aya. Ah. The young man leaned back. He still looked frustrated, but he turned towards me and apologized. Sorry. Didn't mean to disturb you. It's fine. I waved my hand and then walked up to the counter. The man turned towards me and said, Did you decide on something? Yeah. I placed the card on the table. This one. It's not exactly what I'm looking for, but it should do for the time being. The man nodded and moved to pick up the card. All right. Let me see what dash when he saw it, he froze. I blinked. What's wrong? The young man with red hair leaned over and said, Yeah, Garrett, what's the deal with dash? He saw the card as well and also froze. But then he burst out laughing. The man. Garrett, turned red and then crossed his arms. This doesn't mean anything. Yeah, yeah. Whatever you say. The young man grinned and then leaned on the counter. Picking up the card, he spun it around and said, So you're buying this, hey? That was the plan. I looked at the reaction of the two and frowned. But it looks like that's an issue. Nah. It's just hilarious. The young man slid the card over to me and then tapped the name there. You see that? The person who made the armor. Yes. I frowned. The young man grinned and said, That's me. Welf Crosso, maker of Black Demon. Garrett groaned. I still think that's a terrible name for the armor. Yeah, yeah. The young man. No, Welf waved his hand and said, Not talking to you. Anyway. He looked back at me and said, Could I get your name, pal? I couldn't help but smile at his enthusiasm. I held out my hand and said, Bell. Bell Cranel. He grinned and shook my hand. Great. Glad to meet my first customer. Wait, first customer. I looked at Garrett and said, don't I pay you? He shook his head. Ordinarily, but the money goes to the maker anyway. Welf nodded. Yeah. So butt off already, Garrett. Garrett held up his hands and then walked off. Fine. I'll go package the armor then. Anyway. Welf looked at me and said, You said that Black Demon wasn't exactly what you were looking for. So what are you looking for? 
Is the design too showy? Parts too heavy? No. I shook my head. It's fine. And I like the design actually. I grinned and said, super slick and intimidating while being able to face tank most attacks. It's great. Yeah. Welf pumped a fist in the air and said, I knew someone would get me. He paused. Then what's the problem? He scanned my physique and frowned. Mm. I made it with my body as the base so it's a bit bigger than most people, but you're around the same build as me, so it should fit, right? I'm guessing that's not the problem. Do you not like the material? That's right. I nodded and said, I think it was a good idea to have a base with an exterior layer to support it, but you chose the wrong metals. Lead is good for the exterior, but it's too heavy. It also dents pretty easily. Not that much of an issue, but repair would be a hassle. The steel base was a good idea though. If anything, I'd do something like a steel base with layered alloys on top to dampen attacks while stopping them at the core. Welf blinked and then he let out a wide grin. Damn. You a blacksmith too, Belle? Those are some pretty good ideas. He placed a hand on his chin and said, it's pretty hard to do, but something like that would be pretty good. I shrugged and said, I just like to analyze things and come up with ideas. That's so. Garrett came back with a big box and said, you wanna carry this back now? Or should I send it somewhere? Ah. I wanted to just toss it in my inventory, but that would definitely raise flags. So instead, I gave him the address of the church. Mm. Got it. Garrett nodded and said, I'll have it out by the end of the day. Welf looked at me and then said, you not planning on wearing it out. I chuckled. That'd be fun, but I have a few more errands to run. Maybe in the future though. Errands. Hey. Welf looked at me and said, you want to grab some food? Hi. Since you're a fan of my work, I've got a proposal for you. Chapter 17, Is it wrong to throw my new friend into the wolf's den? Welf slid a tray with a sandwich over to me and then sat down at the seat across from me. After mentioning that he had a proposal for me, Welf led me to a small cafe on the second floor of Babel. Or rather, a small table outside of said cafe. Here you go. It's not much, but I hope you don't mind. I shook my head and took the sandwich. It's fine. Food is food. Welf laughed. True enough. I picked up the sandwich and then said, so what did you want to talk about? Since you're treating me to food, I'm guessing it's fairly important. MMHM. Welf nodded. You see, I'm looking to join a party. You look like a pretty experienced adventurer, Belle, so I was hoping I could party with you in exchange for being your personal blacksmith. Ah. I frowned and took a bite of my sandwich. After that, I said, not that I mind you joining my party, but I'm still a newbie, you know. Eh. Welf blinked and said, you're, a newbie. MMHM. I nodded and said, I've only been in Orario for. I think a little under a week. I paused and said, come to think of it, I don't think it's even been a full week yet. Wait. Welf held up his hand and then said, what familia are you from, Belle? If you don't mind me asking. I'm from Hestia's familia. Welf frowned. I don't recognize that name. A new goddess. MMHM. Both of us are actually pretty new to Orario. Then how did you get the money to buy Black Demon? No offense, but even if it was underpriced by that bastard, it's still more than what a new adventurer could afford. Ah. I nodded. That's because I got swarmed on the first floor. I paused and said, I think I had to fight off about a hundred or so cobalts. Either way, money adds up fast. Welf blinked again and then muttered, that explains why you need better armor. But seriously. Seriously. I took a bite of my sandwich and said, why? Are you second-guessing yourself now? Welf shook his head. No. If that's true, it's definitely what I need to level up. Level up. I blinked and said, you're a blacksmith though, aren't you? Is there a need to level up? Welf nodded. There is. You might not know about it yet since you and your goddess are new to Orario, but it's possible to earn a developmental ability when you level up. And for blacksmiths like me, it's essential to get the blacksmith ability. Mm, can't you go train with your other familia members though? In a place like this, 
the first place to turn to for help should be your own familia members due to the inherent danger in things. But to go to someone like me? Welf sighed. I would, but... Well, it's complicated. He shook his head and said, anyway, I need to level up, and getting stuck in challenging situations like that is exactly what I need. So. He leaned forward and grinned. What do you say, pal? Wanna make a party? Sure, but just to make things clear, I think the dungeon hates me. Every time I've entered it, I've had a string of bad luck with ambushes and monster hordes. Odds are more likely than not that you'll be in mortal danger every time we enter. And when is an adventurer not in mortal danger? Besides, you made it out all right, didn't you? Can't be that bad, right? Well, don't say I didn't warn you. I held out my hand and said, Welcome to the party, Welf. Welf grinned and shook my hand. Glad to be working with you, Belle. Now. Should we get going? It's probably good to get a handle on how we fight, right? Just let me finish my sandwich. And if it's too much for you down there, feel free to leave whenever you want. It would probably be dangerous, but if I wasn't alone. Things should be fine. And it wasn't like the dungeon would spawn another horde of monsters so soon after I cleared one out, right? Welf waved his hand and said, I'll be fine. I might be a blacksmith, but I'm a lot tougher than I look, you know. If you say so. Triple X. Welf grit his teeth and then kicked a cobalt out of his way. Afterwards, he spun around, swinging his greatsword and cleaving through a horde of goblins running towards him. You weren't kidding, Belle. The white-haired man slid past a cobalt swinging its club and quickly snapped its neck. Afterwards, he grabbed it and threw it backwards, bowling over some goblins. I told you. Dungeon hates me. Welf quickly wiped the sweat out of his brow and then looked around. It was the first floor. It was the first floor of the dungeon, but it had somehow turned out like this. Bell hadn't been joking when he mentioned the dungeon hated him. After finishing their food, the newly formed party headed down into the dungeon for some light training. A bit of coordination to get a feel for how each other fought. At least, that was the plan. But barely a few rooms in, the walls, ceiling, and floor burst into cracks, flooding the place with monsters. If Welf was being honest, he was scared shitless. Ten, twenty, at least a hundred monsters were spawning in. And more as he stared at the surroundings. If he was alone, he might have choked up and made a fatal mistake. But he wasn't alone. Come on. Don't stand around stiff like that. Even dumb guys like this will be able to hit you if you stop moving. Bell calmly spoke out advice while cutting monsters apart. One slash, three dead. An inhuman precision, killing as many monsters as he could while maintaining a calm demeanor and reserving energy. True to Bell's word, three goblins suddenly leapt at wealth. He stepped back and swung his sword, cleaving them apart. And then he moved back some more, scanning his surroundings. Easier said than done, Palestine. Everywhere Welf looked, all he could see were monsters. Monsters that wanted nothing more than to rip him apart. It's easier done than said, actually. Just keep moving and slashing. These guys aren't that dangerous as long as you keep an eye on their weapons and prevent being grabbed. Besides, you've got the reach of that great sword. Just use it and keep them at bay. Welf chuckled and then tightened his grip on his sword. Right. Can't be dragging my pal down like this. He narrowed his eyes and focused. It was like Bell said. Welf had the advantage of having his weapon reaching the enemy before they could reach him. Even the kobolds with their clubs were out of range if Welf fought properly. The problem was the fighting properly bit. It had only been ten or so minutes, but he was already drained. Even so. Seeing Bell fighting off so many monsters with just a small knife, Welf couldn't slack off. Glue. Letting out a battle cry, Welf stepped forward. Before, he had been just enduring the onslaught, but now he went on the offensive. A heavy slash, cleaving a dozen goblins in half. Stomping the ground, he stepped back and pivoted, swinging his sword up. A kobold trying to sneak attack Welf fell apart in halves. Bell laughed. Good. Like that. Welf. He idly dodged a knife thrown at his head and then threw one back. Keep pressing the advantage. How? The hell? Are you, so relaxed? Welf spat out his words in between slashes. 
a lot of training and a meticulous workout regime. I'll share it with you sometime. Ah, and to your left. Welf spun and slashed to his left. A goblin screeched, trying to grab Welf's knee and failing. Welf sighed and then raised his sword again. Only, sixty or so left to go. Great. Triple X. Here. I handed Welf a potion and then sat down beside him. Thanks. The blacksmith downed the potion and let out a content sigh. Never thought the day would come when I'd be exhausted fighting just some goblins and kobolds. Regretting your life decisions. Nah. Welf grinned and said, stuff like this is just what I need to build up Exilia to level up. Although. He frowned and looked at me. You seem used to all of this. Did you fight monsters before coming to Orario? Nope. I was just a regular farm boy living out in the countryside with my grandpa. Welf shook his head. You must be super talented then. He looked out at the surroundings and said, to be able to do all of this. I didn't blame him. Over a hundred monsters corpses littered the ground. Mostly goblins, but quite a few kobolds as well. A quarter of them were ripped apart by giant slashes, Welf's handiwork. But most of them were killed with precision strikes, perfectly aimed and calculated to kill with the least amount of effort. I shrugged and said, maybe. Grandpa never told me who my parents were, so it might just run in the blood. Blood, hey. A strange emotion crossed Welf's face and he nodded. I guess things like that can happen. Anyway. You did pretty good, Welf. I was somewhat expecting you to just get stalled up somewhere, but you did a good job pressing forward and whittling the enemies down. Not as good as you. Damn. He shook his head and pushed himself to his feet, using his sword as a cane. Only a week, hey? Huh? I can't even imagine how far you'll go if you're already this strong, Belle. You gotta give yourself some credit too, Welf. Personally, I can't think of a person who wouldn't be panicking at being mobbed with so many monsters. Keeping your calm during all of that. Definitely impressive. Hat. <laughs> Welf grinned and said, enough puffing ourselves up. He looked around at the monster corpses and then rolled his shoulder. We should get started on collecting all of these if we want to get back before nightfall. Ah. I waved my hand and said, don't worry about it. I've got this. No. You did most of the fighting, so at the least huh? Welf cut off. I didn't blame him. After all, the hundred or so monster corpses suddenly vanished, turning into smoke. In their place, monster drops littered the floor. This time, not just goblin ears, but also goblin fangs mixed in with the cobalt tails. Rare drops, maybe? That was inevitable considering how many we killed. But it looked like it wasn't a guaranteed drop from each monster. Maybe since Welf killed a few of them? Or maybe my luck streak was running out. Needed to do some testing on that later. Welf blinked, still confused. Wait. What just happened? I walked over and started picking up the drops, auto-sorting them into piles in my inventory before dropping them back out. After that, I glanced at Welf and said, you good with a 50-50 split? Welf nodded. That's fine, but seriously Belle. What just happened? Where did all the monsters go? And why are there so many drops? I walked back over to Welf and held out my hand. Bag please. It'll be simpler to fill it this way than by hand. Welf blinked but did as I asked. When I grabbed his bag, I opened up my inventory and then shoved as many things as I could inside. Mostly magic stones, but also all of those fangs. As a blacksmith, Welf could probably get better use out of those than I could. But even as I filled his bag, there were still a lot of random drops left. I finished filling his bag and then frowned. This will be a bit troublesome to carry out, but here. Welf took his bag back and then looked inside. When he saw the glittering magic stones, he blinked again and shook his head. Looking at me, he said, a typical farmer boy, hi. Hey. Yep. I swept the remaining drops into my inventory and said, just a typical farmer boy dreaming of being a hero. Welf shrugged. Well, guess this makes things easier. He looked towards the direction of the stairs going down and said, Are we going any deeper today? I'd love to. But I made a promise to get back early today. I did a mental count of the time that passed and then nodded. It's around two right now, so I'd like to head back for now. Besides, I think you need some rest, 
and we probably shouldn't tempt fate. Welf nodded. Rest, yet. I could definitely use some after all of that. Though. He stared back towards the stairs and said, if this is what it's like for you on the first floor, I'm a bit worried about what it'll be like going forward. Might have to make a few things to keep us safe. I sighed. Yeah. I'm worried about that too. Still not sure why the dungeon keeps trying to ambush me, but it's better for us not to press our luck. You never know if it might decide to drop a super monster or something our way. Like the Reaper from Persona or the other various floor cleaners in mystery dungeon games where you dragged your feet too long. Mm. That's true. Let's get going then. I sheathed my knife and then headed back towards the stairs. Better not give the dungeon time to rethink its life decisions. W wait for me, Bell. Chapter 18, Is It Wrong to Want a Happy Family? Thank you for buying some Jagamericans, Mr. Fina let out a bright smile and waved. Come again next time, okay? The adventurer was a gruff middle-aged man with dark brown hair and scars over his grey eyes. A serious and stern individual. Even so, he let out a soft smile at Fina's expression and nodded before walking away with the potato snacks. It was an odd sight. After all, the man looked like someone who wouldn't even grunt if he got stabbed, and yet when facing Fina he couldn't help but return her bright expression. And he hadn't been the only one like that today. Hestia watched Fina and let out a sigh. I suppose this is a good thing. After Fina came to help Hestia sell the potato snacks, there was a surge of business. Part of it was due to the novelty of seeing a cute young girl, but soon enough it turned into a sort of indirect support. Curious individuals came over to see what the commotion was about, and then when they saw Fina's energetic waves and service, they stuck around to help her out. Of course, Hestia made sure to keep a careful eye on everyone to make sure there weren't any impure intentions. But it seemed like there weren't. At least, none that had come to buy snacks from Fina yet. Fina carefully counted the valise from the last purchase and then handed them to Hestia. Here you go, mommy. Hestia smiled and took them. Thank you, sweetie. Hee <laughs> hee. Fina smiled back and lowered her head, shifting shyly in place. Seeing that made Hestia's heart warm. It was still odd. The fact that Fina looked so much like her that it was impossible to not think Fina was her child, and the fact that her features were just like Belle's with her one red eye and that pure white hair. It was like looking into the future of what could be. Or rather, like peering into a dream. A child. Her child. Not just a part of her familia, but her flesh and blood. And she was, in a way. Like Belle said, Fina had a bit of herself inside of her, as well as a bit of Belle. While Fina wasn't birthed by Hestia, and while Fina's true nature was unclear, the fact was that, in that moment, in the present, she was their child. And that thought. Hestia set the valis aside and then pulled Fina in for a hug. Eat. Fina shifted in Hestia's embrace and looked up. Mommy. It's nothing, sweetie. Hestia brushed Fina's long white hair and let out a soft smile. Mommy's just happy right now. Oh. Fina nodded and hugged Hestia back. I'm happy too. Mm. Hestia let Fina go and then looked up at the sky. The sun was setting now, long past noon. Seeing that, Hestia frowned and said, Did something happen to Bell again? He said that he would only take a quick look in the dungeon, but he hadn't returned yet. Daddy. Hestia nodded, still mulling over her thoughts. That's right. Mommy's just thinking about your daddy right now Dash. No, mommy. It's daddy. And look, he brought a friend. Eat. Hestia blinked and then looked down. When she did, she saw that Fina was right. Belle was walking down the street, the same as always. A heroic face, lightly curled white hair and a confident smile. Even now, Hestia could see a few female adventurers and travelers turn to stare at him. It annoyed her a bit, but she let it be. After all, it was impossible for them not to stare with how he was now after his ridiculous training. Perfectly trained muscles like a sculpted statue and that confident aura, paired with his sharp eyes and bright smile. If Hestia fell for him after being a virgin goddess since the dawn of time, she couldn't fault any other girl. That didn't mean she'd let them step in on her territory though. To rub it in, Hestia stood up and waved at Belle. Putting a bright smile on her face, she said, Hi honey. Back from work already. 
The man walking with Bell, a young man with red hair and a giant sword strapped to his back, stumbled. He blinked and quickly flitted his eyes to Bell, Hestia, and then to Fina. As he did, it was almost possible to see the gears spurring in his head. Bell sighed and opened his mouth, presumably to explain to the red-haired man. But before he could, Fina dashed out from the counter. Daddy! She grabbed Bell's waist, pulling him in a tight hug and said, I missed you. Bell sighed again and pinched the bridge of his nose. But after that, he put a smile on his face and patted Fina's head. I missed you too, princess. Did you have a good day with mommy? MMHM. Fina nodded and said, we sold a lot of Jagamara Kuns. Oh, I sold a lot too. She smiled and said, there were a lot of nice people. Is that so? Bell tilted his head and looked over at Hestia. Fina wasn't a bother. Hestia huffed. How could our sweet Fina ever be a bother? Bell laughed and patted Fina's head again. Of course. Just being silly, I guess. Hestia looked over to the young man beside Bell and said, I see you made a friend, Bell. Oh yeah. Bell nodded and turned towards the young man at his side. As he did, he spun Fina around, holding her in his arms and said, Fina. Tia. This is Welf, my party member. He's a really nice guy that put up with a troublesome guy like me. Hestia hummed. Welf, is it? Oh well. Welf quickly bowed his head and said, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, Lady Hestia, is it? Hestia started cleaning up her stand and said, just Hestia's fine. If you're helping Belle, then there's no need to be on formalities. All right. Welf nodded. But then he glanced at Fina, confusion filling his eyes. He looked up at Belle and said, um. Not to pry or anything, Belle, but this girl Dash. I'm Fina. Fina smiled and waved. It's nice to meet you, Mr. Welf. Right. Nice to meet you too, Fina. But, um. Welf glanced back at Hestia and then at Fina. Hestia hesitated, wondering how to explain the situation. Especially when she saw some nearby adventurers idling to hear the explanation. But Belle wasn't deterred or put off. Instead, as if to affirm it, he lifted Fina up and plopped her around his shoulders. Eat. Daddy. Fina giggled and said, I'm not small anymore. You can't do that. I can, and I will. Belle grinned and then turned to Welf. As for who Fina is. Isn't it obvious? She's my daughter and sweet little princess. He made a point to glance around at the surroundings and said, that's all you need to know. Ah. Welf seemed to be quick on the uptake and nodded. Got it. Belle's grin widened and he said, I knew you were reliable, bro. Welf laughed. Bro, hi. What an honor. Belle winked. Oh it is. You just don't know it yet. Welf shook his head and then turned back towards Hestia. With a short bow, he said, it was nice meeting you, lady I mean, Hestia. He raised his head and waved at Fina. You too, Fina. Take care. Hestia blinked and said, you're leaving, Mr. Welf. She turned to Belle and said, you aren't inviting him for dinner. Belle shrugged. I offered, but dash. Welf laughed. It's fine. I've got more than enough from Belle here today. Besides. He rolled his shoulder and winced. After the workout we went through, I think I'll be taking it easy for a day or two and relax in the forge. Belle chuckled. Only a blacksmith would call banging metal in a blazing furnace relaxation. You know it. Welf waved one last time and then said, I'm off then. You know where to find me if you need me, right Belle? Considering the number of times you told me on the way back, it'd be hard not to. Great. Then I'll catch you tomorrow to go over some new armor ideas. Let me know how Black Demon fits, alright. With that, Welf vanished into the crowd. Hestia finished closing up her stall and then walked over to Belle. She stared after where Welf had gone and said, Seems like you've found a good friend, Belle. Fina leaned forward and said, Mr. Welf seems nice, Daddy. Belle smiled. Yeah. Welf's a good guy. Ah. Almost forgot. He reached into his bag and then pulled out a smaller bag. Unlike the one Belle used to hold his dungeon spoils and Valis, this new bag was clear and transparent, holding, magic stones? No, it was just candy that looked like magic stones. 
Hestia blinked and then tilted her head. Bell. Before she could ask anything else, Fina squealed and said, You remembered. Of course I did, princess. Bell held up the bag and said, Here you go. Don't eat too many now, all right? Too much sugar isn't good for you. K. Fina snatched the bag from Bell's hand and then opened it, carefully pulling out a single crystal. Afterwards, she plopped it in her mouth and then let out a happy squeal. Bell smiled at that and then turned towards Hestia. Glancing at the stall, he said, You done for the day. Hestia moved close to Bell and nodded. Since a certain someone took longer than he said he would, I figured I might as well turn in for the day. She glanced at Fina and said, Our cute mascot did more than enough to make up for it anyway. Bell chuckled. All right. Let's get going then. With that, Bell started walking towards the church, holding Fina on his shoulders while the young girl munched on the crystal candy. Hestia smiled and followed after them. Triple X. At the top of Babel, gazing down on the world below. From her seat by the window, a goddess of beauty watched a certain trio making their way down the street. Strange. Freya muttered and carefully observed her targets. The first was a young man. He was different now, but there was no mistaking who he was. A wondrous mix of pure black and white, perfectly separated and yet swirled together in harmony. It was a stark contrast from the beautifully clear soul she first saw. From that time, and from how he seemed to be able to sense her gaze, Freya had been interested. But now she was even more interested. How did he change his body so quickly? Freya idly swirled her finger around a wine glass and hummed, lost in thought. The young man she saw the first time had been a frail and wispy thing, like a pure white bunny. One with a beautiful transparent soul. But that young man and beautiful soul was nowhere to be seen now. In his place was a... Well, who he would become was yet to be seen. But at the moment, Freya thought he seemed quite like a hero. A brilliant, confident and unyielding hero that would face down any foe, and one with such a curious mix of black and white in his soul. Of good and evil, kindness and malice. But while interesting, the other small light next to him was even more so. A beautiful young girl with a soul the purest white that Freya had ever seen. A pure white surrounded by a lovely blue flame. A blue flame the same color as Hestia's divine authority, emanating the same light as well. Close enough that it was impossible to see it as anything but an extension of that childish goddess's authority. But it wasn't. Others might not be able to distinguish it, but Freya could. The same shade, but a different texture. Where Hestia's flame was calm and comforting, that blue flame around the young girl's soul was bubbling and energetic. As if Hestia's flame had mixed with something else to change in nature. As if that girl was her child. But that was impossible. At the least, it should be impossible. Yet, the signs were all there. The Virgin Goddess. Well, it was debatable whether that title remained true. Either way, the goddess of home and hearth had hidden it well, but it was impossible to hide it from Freya. Hmm. Freya placed her finger on her chin and thought about what she should do. For now, it could be explained away. After all, it was fundamentally impossible for gods to have children. Because of that, while it was suspicious, most would brush it off as coincidence. But Freya had no doubt the more astute gods had noticed. And with Ganesha's banquet coming up. I suppose I should help her out a bit. If that girl was truly Hestia's child. And if that child was one born from a union between her and that adventurer Freya had her eyes on. Well, Freya was a goddess of love and beauty. She could accept Hestia being the first as the goddess of home and hearth, but there was no way that Freya would lose out on being any later than the second goddess to birth a child. Especially when they turned out to be as cute as that lovely little thing. Chapter 19 is it wrong to make your friend deal with your BS? I felt a shiver down my spine. The same sensation that I noticed before. Someone watching me. No, not just me. But Fina and Hestia as well. Even so, I suppressed my reaction. I didn't think the gaze was hostile, but I didn't want to risk it. Especially not with Fina here. So instead, I put on a smile and turned to Hestia and said, I'm guessing your day went well then. Hestia nodded and responded with a smile of her own. It was great. She looked up at Fina and said, Our little princess here was wonderful. Fina giggled and said, It was fun. Good to hear, princess. I'd be upset if you didn't have fun. 
Hestia huffed. And what's that supposed to mean, Bell? Are you implying something? Of course not. Just saying that I'd be sad that our little princess here wasn't enjoying herself. Fina shook her head and said, I'm happy as long as I'm with mommy and daddy. Fina. Hestia's gaze softened. The rest of our walk back to the church passed by in comfort, just idle chatter passing between us. I noticed some people give us strange looks, but I didn't sense any hostile gazes. And that mysterious presence seemed to have stopped observing us too. That was good. Though, the fact that I still didn't know who or what that presence was bothered me. Daddy. Fina leaned forward, teetering over my head. I flinched and quickly adjusted her. Oi, hold on there. That's dangerous. Oh well. Sorry. But look. Fina pointed and said, there's a big box. Hmm. Hestia looked over and blinked. She's right. Did my ache drop something off for us? A giant wooden box was standing in front of the iron gate. Well, not too giant. Still, considering the fact that it looked like Fina could fit inside of it, the box was pretty big. I also knew what it was. Oh, that's just my new armor. I set Fina down and then walked over to the box. Fina dashed after me, staring at the box with wide eyes. Oh. What does it look like? Well. I opened the box. It was nailed shut. Probably because it needed to be sturdy to hold the heavy armor. But that wasn't a problem for me. I just reached out and pocketed the nails in my inventory. The lid was left after that, and I easily pried it off, revealing the shiny black armor inside. Oh. Fina let out a gasp of admiration and said, that looks cool. Hestia leaned over to look and frowned. And expensive. She looked up at me and said, how much did it cost? I waved my hand and said, don't worry about it, Tia. I made more than enough. And besides, it's Welf's creation. Buying it let me run into him so I'll take it as a good investment. Hestia frowned and slowly nodded her head. I, suppose. But even so, it can't have been cheap. I patted her head and said, like I said, don't worry about it, Tia. I make more than enough to cover up something like this. And it should help me make even more in the near future. After all, the only thing I had to fear was getting slashed by the goblins in the dungeon. Now with this. Well, it was time to go grind. Fina looked at me and said, are you going to try it on, daddy? I looked around and said, not out here, but after we get inside. I paused and said, and after we have dinner. I'm pretty hungry from the dungeon, and I've got a feeling you two didn't eat very well today. Hestia coughed and blushed. Fina huffed and said, I ate a lot though. Yeah, a lot of junk food. I lightly tapped Fina's head and said, now come on, princess. Let's get you some proper food so that you can grow up big and strong like your dad instead of a shrimp like your mommy. Hey. Hestia pouted and jabbed me in the side. I am not a shrimp. And I'm growing. Of course you are, Tia. I smiled and stored Black Demon away in my inventory along with the crate. After that, I opened the gate and walked inside. Let's go, you two. Triple X. Dinner was a quick affair. Mostly because Hestia and Fina were hungrier than they let on. Or maybe because my cooking was just that good. Either way, it didn't take long after I made the food that the two girls in our small family finished eating and turned in for an early night due to a food coma. I sighed as I tucked Fina in with Hestia on the mattress and said, Honestly. You two should have a bit more restraint, you know. Neither of the two heard me. Or if they did, they didn't react. Instead, Hestia gently hugged Fina to her chest. Likewise, Fina smiled and leaned against Hestia. It was a beautiful sight. Like that, Fina and Tia really looked like mother and daughter. Which meant that there would be complications later. If it really was impossible for gods to have children, then people wouldn't believe that Fina was Tia's daughter. But with how she looked, her powers, and the fact that she called us her parents. If enough evidence was there, no matter how unreasonable the conclusion, it had to be the truth. Unless there was an alternative explanation. And frankly, there really wasn't one at this point. But there was still a bit of time on that, so I could think on it later. After checking in on Fina and Tia one more time and making sure they were comfortable, I left the room and walked outside. It was just turning into night time. 
The blue sky had turned a deep violet, and I could see the moon rising. It wouldn't be long now until the night sky emerged and filled with stars. But that didn't matter much. What did was my training. I opened my inventory and checked on the armor. Like all the other items, it floated about in its own little box. But it was also a bit different. Was it because my inventory skill responded to my will? Or was it because of a combination of my skills allowing it? Either way, I could sense that Black Demon would be freely equipable without me having to drag out each piece. Or rather, with just a thought, I could instantly put it on. So I tried it out. Better now than in the dungeon. I focused on that sensation, staring at Black Demon's icon in my inventory. And then... Darkness. Instantly, my vision dimmed, obscured by a black visor. My hearing faded as well, the result of the full-plate helmet surrounding my entire head. But as if responding to my will, that obstruction instantly faded. Energy manipulation activated and then let me see and hear my surroundings as if the helmet wasn't there. And then compilation sorted through the information I was receiving and pieced together a comprehensible understanding. At least, that's what it seemed to be for me. I could only guess, since I didn't really have a way of knowing when those skills were activated, but from the fact that it felt like I wasn't wearing anything at all, they were definitely on. No. It wasn't like I wasn't wearing anything, but only that my senses weren't being obstructed. The moment I tried to move, I felt my body immediately weighed down. But that was obvious. After all, this lead armor that Wealth made was a literal ton of metal. At least, it sure felt like it. But. Perfect. It was just what I needed. I checked my inventory again to see how many health potions I had left. There were, two. Somehow or another, I seemed to have spent most of the ones that my ache gave me. A reason for me to restock soon and help him out, I guess. But this should be enough. I took a deep breath and then nodded. All right. Let's do this. The night was long, and the only surefire way to protect my new family was to gain strength. And the only way to do that was to grind. So. We'll start with burpees. I took a deep breath and then went back to my routine, modifying it with my new weighted armor. Triple X. Welf wiped his forehead and then glanced out the window. Morning already, hi. After fighting in the dungeon with Bell the other day, he had a lot on his mind. Mostly about what they would be doing from that point forward. Bell was, different. Putting the situation with his daughter and ambiguous relationship with his goddess aside, the guy was insane. Probably literally, but at the least in terms of his abilities. While they were only on the first floor of the dungeon, the fact remained that they had been mobbed by a horde of monsters. Sure, they might have been just goblins and kobolds, but when there were hundreds of them. Even so, they managed to make it through. And mostly because of Bell. I see why he needs some good armor now at least. Welf muttered and then went back to hammering the steel plat email he was working on. It was odd. Monsters shouldn't be showing up in that high amount. But from what Bell said, it was natural for him. Was it because of his relationship with his goddess? The fact that he had a daughter that looked just like Lady Hestia? Or was it because he had just that much potential that the dungeon was trying to get rid of him? Being able to materialize and dematerialize items as he wished, that calm combat awareness and ability that seemed like a veteran with countless years of experience despite being new to Orario. Well frowned and subconsciously found himself staring at the wrapped sword in the corner of his forge. Blood, hi. Bell had mentioned it. He had just been an ordinary farmer boy until he came to Orario. But after his fauna, he got stronger. And not just by a little bit. The guy said he didn't know the reason why, but if he had to guess, it was his blood. Inherited from parents that he didn't know about. Welf shook his head and then leaned back to stare at the ceiling. What a mess. Rationally, Welf thought that he should distance himself from Bell. From just the little bit that he knew about the guy, Welf could tell that he was more of a bomb than Welf himself was. After all, while being able to make magic swords was enough to start a war, being able to safely store items away like that as well as his combat abilities. Welf had a gut feeling. And his gut had never been wrong. Bell was special. Unlike the other adventurers, and even unlike Welf who had the Crosso blood, Bell was going to end up at a place far ahead of everyone else. And as a result, the enemies he would have to face would be that much stronger as well. Even so. Arg. 
What am I thinking about? Welf scowled at himself and then hammered the glowing metal on his anvil. It was stupid. Didn't he hate being judged by his talents? Didn't he hate how everyone only saw him for his ability to make magic swords? And didn't he hate how people jumped to conclusions about him and avoided him because it was too much trouble? He was doing the same thing with Bell right now. Just because his life might get more troublesome, Welf was thinking about leaving the party. That. Hey, bro. You busy right now. Welf flinched and looked towards the doorway. There, a looming figure stood. Pitch black armor as dark as the night sky that gave off a demonic appearance from the unnaturally sleek edges and bulk. A presence on its own that emitted an intimidating aura separate from the person inside. But Welf recognized it, as well as the voice that spoke out. Carefully setting aside his work, Welf turned towards the doorway and said, Bell. That's right. Bell walked into the forge and looked around. Well, Welf assumed that was what he was doing. It was hard to tell considering the guy's entire body was covered in armor and his head wasn't moving. It's a pretty cozy place you've got here. Bell gave an approving nod. Though it's a bit hard to get to. Welf rubbed the back of his neck and said, yeah. Sorry about that. I'm still just a newbie according to everyone else, so wait a minute. He stood up and shook his head. Forget about that. What are you doing here, Bell? Bell tilted his head and said, didn't you want me to tell you how Black Demon fit? Welf paused. I, did say that, didn't I? But you didn't have to come here so early in the morning. The sun had just risen a bit ago, and the walk from the church to Welf's forge was pretty far. At least an hour. But to arrive wearing that armor. Welf frowned and said, was there a problem? That was the only thing he could think of. But unlike what Welf thought, Bell shook his head. No. Black Demon's great. It fits well, and it's also extremely heavy. Just the sort of armor I needed to use to train. Train. Welf blinked. Bell nodded. That's right. To be honest, this suit of armor is pretty unwieldy. The individual parts are heavy and the overall weight makes it near impossible to move around properly. Welf winced. That's. I suppose that's true. He had made Black Demon with pure defense in mind so it seemed like he might have missed a few parts. Bell walked over and then leaned against the wall. After that, he waved his hand and said, don't worry about it. Like I said, it makes it near impossible to move around properly, not impossible. He rolled his shoulder, causing the armor to clink, and said, you did a good job hooking everything together. Even while it's bulky and heavy, the problem with movement comes from the user's lack of strength, not the armor's inflexibility or anything. Welf frowned. That doesn't make me feel much better. Staring at Black Demon and Bell moving it around, he said, if it wasn't you or a high-level adventurer using it, Black Demon would just be dead weight. He sighed and said, that's what I get for focusing too much on one aspect, I guess. Damn it. Welf scowled and said, Garrett was right. He was still immature. It wasn't enough to just focus on a concept. You had to take into account all the other factors as well. Bell shrugged. Maybe. But it's good learning experience. I mean, it must have been a struggle making this, right? Of course. Welf nodded and said, getting the mixtures right, hammering each piece into place, carefully making sure the links fit together. I spent weeks on Black Demon. He sighed and said, but from what you said, it seems like it was a failure. Bell tried to soften the impact, but it was evident that Black Demon was a failure. It looked cool and had good defensive power in theory, but in practice it was worthless. Hell, it would take a high-ranked adventurer to be able to walk around with it, let alone fight. Wait. Welf blinked and quickly turned his gaze back to Bell. What? Bell tilted his head. Welf frowned and said, did you walk here in that? From the church. Bell nodded. Of course I did. I told you, didn't I? This is great training armor. Training armor, he said. And that meant that he walked that entire distance from the church, wearing that. Welf knew that Bell was strong, and his build showed that even without his fauna, Bell was used to lifting heavy things, but Black Demon was on a whole different level. And he just casually walked over to Welf's forge wearing it. No, from how Bell was talking normally and easily moved his body around, it seemed like the guy was already used to it. Welf blinked again and said, Bell. 
yet. Has anyone told you that you're insane? Bell chuckled. Chapter 20, Is It Wrong to Set Up Fast Travel? I stepped forward and threw a punch at the cobalt in front of me. The humanoid wolf monster swung its club out to block, but it broke against my armored fist. And a moment later, the cobalt itself broke, pulverized into a mist of blood and gore. I lowered my armored hand and grinned. That felt awesome. I knew it was a good idea to have armor like this. A wry laugh echoed from the side. Welf. He shook his head and said, Only you, Bell. He shifted his gaze to the cobalt and said, I'm happy that my armor found a proper user. But what kind of monster have I made? Ha ha. Very funny. I walked over to the cobalt and picked up the drops. A magic stone and the usual tail. Afterwards, I took a look around. After catching up for a bit, Welf said that he wanted to see Black Demon in action. Of course, he probably just wanted a demo in his forge, but I was itching to use it, so I dragged ER, convinced Welf to head back down into the dungeon with me. Hestia and Fina were still sleeping when I left this morning, but I left a note for the two of them that I'd be heading out with Welf, so it should be fine. I did feel a bit guilty about leaving the two of them alone, but it couldn't be helped. I needed to get stronger, and fast. If I wanted to make sure my family was safe, then I couldn't afford to be weak. And the quickest way to do that was by fighting. Though, it seemed like the dungeon had other plans. I stared at the empty surroundings and frowned. Weird. There's usually more than this. Welf shook his head and said, I think that you're the weird one, Belle. The dungeon doesn't usually spawn hordes of monsters to fight an adventurer, you know. True. But considering that it had happened four times, I thought it would always be the case for me. You sound disappointed. I straightened my body and shrugged. A bit. While it's good that it's less dangerous, you can only really improve when facing a proper battle. Besides, I kind of liked being able to pick up a lot of income in one go. Welf sighed and shook his head. You really are different from most adventurers, Belle. Eh. I've only been one for a short while so that's to be expected. I frowned. But then, should we go deeper? I turned my gaze towards deeper into the dungeon where the stairway should be. Welf walked over and said, it's up to you. I'm good with whatever. You know, being that casual about things makes it easy to become a casualty, right? Welf laughed. True. But I'm partying with a superhuman guy that can move around in that hunk of metal like it's nothing. I think it'll be fine. And besides, I trust you. He grinned and said, after all, you aren't the type of guy to head into dangerous situations and leave his family behind, are you? You got me. I laughed and then looked around again. There weren't any of the usual shadowy presences. In fact, it almost seemed like the dungeon was actively keeping them away from me. And the usual malevolent gaze I felt every time I entered the dungeon was gone. Maybe I had gotten rid of so many monsters that it had to recover? Or maybe there were other adventurers it was focusing on instead since I was so troublesome? I didn't know the answer. But I did know one thing. And that was that today was, surprisingly safe. Let's get going then. I tilted my head towards Welf and said, You mentioned you've been to the seventh floor before? By yourself. Welf nodded. Yeah. It's a bit dangerous, but nothing we can't handle. And even if a horde of monsters pops up, the dungeon is wider too, so we won't get trapped or anything. I think it's more dangerous to be in an open place with a horde of monsters than a small area, but I suppose it's true that running might be easier in that case. So we going deeper then? I nodded. Might as well ah. Uh. I want to try something first. Let's see. I took a look around the surroundings and focused. It was the usual room, a few rooms over from the stairs. A bit out of the way, but not too much. After doing some experimenting with my inventory skill, another idea came to mind. And since I had a rather large surplus of magic stones to work with after yesterday, I wanted to test it out. Quantum magic let me create an inventory skill by basically ripping out a piece of space and letting me claim it. It took a lot of mana to do so, but the fact that it was possible, and the shenanigans I could do as a result showed that there might be more I could do. The fauna in this world was already game-like, and I had managed to make a game-like inventory skill. So then, logically, I should be able to make other things. Like a return teleporter. At least, I thought so. 
no, I needed it to work. If I wanted to be able to return home every day to spend time with Fina and Hestia, I couldn't afford to not have a return teleporter. So. I focused. Bell. Welf's confused voice sounded out. But I ignored him for the time being. The setup was already done. Back at home, I had already managed to store a small pocket of space at the back of the church in my inventory. It was complicated, but the long and short of it was that it worked. So then I should be able to do something similar here. And if I linked the two. I held up my hand and spread out my awareness. The malevolent presence. A malicious mana floating in the air. I ignored them both and slowly spread out my own mana. At the same time, I focused on the dozens of magic stones in my inventory. Quantum magic. I still didn't know exactly what it represented or its limits, but I knew that it had something to do with space, energy, and states. How else was my inventory preserving momentum if that wasn't true? Something in that logic was messed up, but I ignored it. If I was wrong, it didn't matter as long as it worked. And if it worked, I was right. That was all I needed to know. So. Binding the space around me to my will. Compiling the spatial coordinates to link up to my inventory skill. Creating a channel via a wormhole that allowed instantaneous movement through space. I felt that malevolent presence look at me. But I also felt confusion from it. As if it didn't know what I was doing. Was it my imagination? I didn't know. But it didn't matter. All of a sudden, I felt something snap into place. A bright flash, followed by a hazy distortion. What the dash? Welf cried out in surprise and stepped back. Bell. I lowered my hand. And the moment I did, I saw it. Like with my inventory skill, a small window appeared. A simple one. A small list with two locations stored. The church, and then the first floor. It was scrollable, and I could see that there were more deeper in the list, but the number of floors was left a mystery, the list blurring out of existence as I scrolled. But tapping on the two places I had activated made my surroundings blur and overlap with those locations. Like I could instantly move there if I focused enough. And with wealth too. But that was for later. I swiped the window away and turned back to wealth. Done. Let's get moving. Welf frowned. Bell. No. Never mind. He sighed and shook his head. It's probably better for me not to know. Do you want to know? I tilted my head and said, I don't mind telling you. No. Welf shook his head again and said, I appreciate you trusting me so much, Bell. But it's better if I don't know the details. He grimaced and said, I'm not that confident in being strong enough to keep that knowledge safe. I nodded in understanding. It was true. Being able to warp around in the dungeon was unheard of. And if word got out. I trusted Welf. He was a good guy, and we got along well. And since he spoke up like that, he also knew his limits well. But because of that, I couldn't tell him. After all, I knew it myself. This was a world where might made right and where the laws in place could be just a formality if you had enough force behind you. All right, I said. Then I'll just say that it's a safety net for the two of us. If things get hairy, we won't have to fight our way out through a horde. Well, hopefully it doesn't come to that. But thanks. Welf smiled. I appreciate it. No problem, bro. You're hanging around a sketchy dangerous guy like me so the least I could do is keep you informed. Welf laughed. Sketchy and dangerous, hi? Well, dressed like that I can see it. And who was the guy who made this thing again? Oh right, you. Welf laughed again and then said, should we get going then? Yeah. I think we've goofed around enough. And I'm curious. I held up my armored gauntlet and clenched my fist. Just how far can this black demon hold up?